Welcome to Kurt Vonnegut's, the podcast dedicated to the life and works and ongoing things of Kurt Vonnegut, because he's the greatest author of all time. My name is Alex Schmidt, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Michael Swaim. What is this? Kurt who? What? <laughs> this is my fr- This is the first I'm hearing about any of this. <laughs> this is not starting well. So it's about an author, and yeah. it's just like this book show. Well, know? this is my fate worse than death. <laughs> this is my high school dream, right? I just yeah, don't like... know what we're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> where you haven't studied and you're nude, and it's the night of the show. Sure. And... Yeah, like we're in a yeah. yeah we're at a New York comic convention, and I step on stage, and they're like. You're going to talk about the Large Hadron Collider, right? And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> what? I thought Batman, but okay. <laughs> no, I'm prepared. Yeah. And now they know too. what my voice sounds like. <laughs> this is their first episode. And as uh, as you sort of alluded to, this is the episode about a book called Fates Worse Than Death. I did. I wove that right in. In 1991. <laughs> And it's an essay collection by Kurt, which means that, you know, we do the segments a little differently, usually for an essay collection, speech collection kind of thing. And I think the first segment would be a segment called Franken Time. It's alive as the musical guest, Frankenstein. (laughs) Straight to Don Pardo. Well, my my Dr. Frankenstein voice sounded a lot like Don Pardo (laughs) announcing. Yeah. (laughs) It's perfect. Yeah. Well, and 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 I'm Matchbox 20. They're alive. (laughs) This actually, I don't know how I didn't put it together in the planning process, but also this episode comes out on Halloween. So, Franken time. Spooky. Thank you for being spooky with us. Or listening to it later in November or whatever. I was going to say you can't spell book without boo, but I'm glad we rolled right past that. (laughs) (laughs) Moving on, moving on. Uh, Franken time is a segment we do with this kind of book where we look at just how it came together in the first place because it's not a standard novel. And it's also the third time that Vonnegut has done this kind of book. The previous two were Palm Sunday, and then the first one was Wampir's Foma and Grand Falloons, where it's sort of an assembling of all the essays and speeches that he's done in the years when he's otherwise writing novels, and also some connective stuff that he wrote himself. Yeah. And, and I hate to be pedantic, Alex, but I do think it's an important point. The segment is not actually called Franken Time. That's yeah. the name of the doctor. <laughs> the segment is Franken Time segment. It's a common misconception. Don't don't get yourself up about it. Which one is Dracula Untold? Exactly. Is that... Who's the real Franken Time? <laughs> Humanity, I would argue. I know that's a bit. I think Mary Shelley comes up in this book. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, that's kind of fun too. Well, Just fits in. The book really is a Frankenstein's monster. This time, it like is feels to me even more cobbled together than Palm Sunday. Big time. Yeah. Possibly because of the use of the parentheticals that we'll talk about. I'm sure. Oh, so much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and it's so it's fitting that he specifically brings up in one of the essays as a metaphor, and he's talking about. The idea that he thinks, which I don't even know if I agree with, that females are naturally more immune to the dangers of technology becoming evil. Yeah. Whereas I respect women enough to think they could be as evil and fucked up and depraved (laughs) as any man. Um, But his, like, piece of evidence is the first notable piece of fiction about how fucking with technology is going to fuck us was Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which is a great, yeah, I like that he brought that in, and I agree with you on the overall yeah. approach toward women. Although I'd argue Prometheus, a little earlier, same deal. Prometheus like the Greek myth? brings like, us fire, and that's, yeah, like, yeah. I think humans have been There's aware no that, that technology can be harmful as far back as fire. Because they're yeah. like, this can cook, but it also burns me. That's all you need to know. About yeah, technology. Totally. <laughs> yeah, especially because like humans are the monster in the Prometheus story and the creators are the gods. Like, it's just sort of yeah. doing it in that uh, more, I guess, religious fashion. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Early in this collection, the first line of chapter one, Vonnegut says, Here we have a sequel, not that anyone has clamored for one, to a book called Palm Sunday, a collection of essays and speeches by me with breezy autobiographical commentary serving as connective tissue and splints and bandages, which is what's going on. More so like again. a bleak wool. <laughs> you'll see why yeah and it also the first book like this Wampier's Foam and Grand Falloons came together because 
in the in 1973, there were two professors, Jerome Klinkowitz and John Summer, who published an essay collection called The Vonnegut Statement, which was like a critical analysis of Vonnegut. And it was pretty much the first one. And in the process of doing that, they collected all of his essays and speeches. And then they went to Vonnegut and said, hey, we have all this stuff. It's like book size. You could probably just put this out. And Vonnegut was like, I could. And so he made one. And then from there, made a point of collecting all his own stuff so he could continue to do that. And that's how we got Palm Sunday and this book. And he literally has an essay in here about how to children of the Depression, any job is as good as another, yeah. including writing. So I have the sneaking suspicion he was just like, that is a clever revenue stream. I'll oh, do yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't even know if these are the most important of his books to him, but maybe I'm jaded by the fact that I want, like, don't you miss the UFO question and the Barnstable oh, effect? Yeah. Speeches are all well and good, but I want, <laughs> I like story structure. This has no story structure. It is, it is, as it says on the cover, an autobiographical collage. Yeah. And I would argue you can see the level of effort he put into each work if you compare this literally judging the book by its cover <laughs> to our last one hocus pocus which i rated very highly the cover of that or rather the inside cover was this whole this field of stick figures that had this whole amazing meaning we unpacked you should listen to the episode it was, great, it was a great yeah. episode fate's worse than death's cover is him in a polo shirt standing in a field of sunflowers clearly the first photo the photographer took and then he was like that's good that's probably good it is it, like, is. it looks like a dave barry cover and the i love dave barry but he's not trying to be earth shattering and vonnegut <laughs> it is the photo the photo is by his his second wife wife at the time jill kremens see so, so he probably just went into the yard and was like babe can you take my cover photo i gotta <laughs> crank this shit out boat payment <laughs> That's so great that you bring in that part where he really says, like, yeah, writing is mostly clerical, and it's yeah. another trade like any other trade. I think he is not opposed to the idea that this book probably primarily exists to make him money. And then also, there's a secondary benefit that he probably believes in of, oh, people can get to know me better and know more about my works. I think, I think he can feel both those things at the same time. Well, he's so. not wrong that he's so historically notable. That a subsect of people, from super fans to like academians, yeah, will be interested in every scrap of writing he happened to leave behind. But that doesn't mean I, Michael Swain, will enjoy reading it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this also of the three collections like this, this is the one where every word in it is fully something that people publish because the author Kurt Vonnegut wrote it. Like a lot of the earlier stuff is, oh, I just, I like won this gig writing an essay or a short story because I needed the work and they liked my submission. And now he's at the point where everything right. he's writing is, oh my God, the Slaughterhouse Five guy, we got to print this. That's true. In that way, it's kind of like a rap album after they become big where they're like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, every <laughs> preface is like, I was speaking to the American Psychological Association. You might wonder why I would. Well, because I'm fucking Kurt Vonnegut. They were yeah. honored to have me there. <laughs> Here's the speech. Right. Pay me. Yeah. The big takeaway is Kurt Vonnegut is everything capitalist and wrong with our consumerist <laughs> society. He's the avatar. He's ah. just Uncle Moneybags, Alex. Ooh. Open your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that money river. We're going to float down it. Vonnegut, Trump, Trump, Vonnegut. Uh, right? Nope. I don't see the difference. That's what nope. I'm saying. <laughs> uh, moving right along. We <laughs> Let's get into the next segment for a book like this. this is a segment called uh, Story Time. Oh, girl, it's oh, story, story time. time. Gonna love you <laughs> till the, the time, time is, is done. done. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I also I hesitated on the way into saying the name of it because it's though. not totally stories. It's no. just essays and speeches. But this is where we go chunk by chunk through a work like this. Yeah. And it's sort of like a plot summary if it had a plot. And this one opens with uh, before the start, there's a sort of joke version of the standard disclaimer, which is all persons living and dead are purely coincidental and should not be construed. No names have been changed to protect the innocent since God Almighty protects the innocent as a matter of heavenly routine. Which is great. It's at this point become his South Park open air. Yeah. <laughs> like it is just, you could he consider it bit. Yeah. retroactively applied to all his books. Well, he's literally said those two disclaimers separately, like the first chunk and the separate second chunk in previous works. And now oh, he's yeah? put them together and been like, <laughs> that's a good. Uh, yeah, he feels good about yeah. it, I guess. Yeah. And I guess I've, I'm just saying that because I feel like a lot of this book, and he says in this book, he says, don't blame me. 
even Jesus, if he had not been crucified, would have started repeating himself. Yeah, like, if you discover the intense. eight true things about life, there's not a lot more to say. And I've lived a long time. So, but bottom line, a lot of the best lines in this book are literally like he is <laughs> rephrasing best lines from previous works. Yeah. Which I find yeah. so funny. And like, all right, we get it. You're great. It's <laughs> like a clip show. It's like a greatest hits clip show. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. 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 So if you're a fan, it's very endearing. But <laughs> if anyone like started their Vonnegut journey with this book, I think oh, they'd that would be, be very disastrous. confused. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's definitely like a, a supporting material. Yeah. Well, that would be like I uh, when I was a kid, I received as a gift a VHS copy of Never Say Never Again, the James Bond movie. Okay. And it's like an unofficial James Bond movie right. with Sean Connery that was the last one of those. And it was because a of like of a Thunderball. contractual disagreement at the yeah, time or something. Yeah. But I, it was one of the first Bonds I saw. And I'm glad it wasn't the first one because I would have been really thrown by that being the start. You know, like it's not, it's a later work with a lot of kind of side elements and huh. it's not totally. In contrast, the, thing. the first Chucky movie I saw was the seventh one. And I caught up quick. Like, I, <laughs> I had no trouble figuring out everything that had happened up to that point. That's because they're masters. Well, it's because, yeah, they're masters of clarity and subtlety and just <laughs> elegance. Yeah. Uh, Brevity okay. is the soul of wit. <laughs> I can barely do a Chucky voice. But yeah, so there's a preface, and then there's 21 sections. Yeah. Some of which, which include multiple speeches. Yeah. They're it's, organized sort of by topic instead of by individual speech. Yeah. It's because in the other ones, he's usually very direct about here is the exact citation of where this came from in the other essay collections. And yeah. this one, he sort of just weaves it in like as Kurt's speaking, he just offhand says, I wrote this for Architectural Digest at one point. You get it, you know? Right. And the only differentiator is if it's in quotes, you know that that yeah. is republished material or a transcript. And then in between quotes, he'll literally just also comment on. It's like listening to Jack O'Brien when he used to host this podcast. <laughs> Back in the day in some of the early episodes. When he hosted Kurt Vonnegut? He would, oh, right. Oh, sorry, crack, crack podcast. <laughs> Remember when he'd drop in in the middle and explain something real quick? Yeah. I just yeah. got his voice in my head with all the parentheticals. Sure. So it's like speeches plus Vonnegut interrupting himself whenever he wants to go, I changed my mind about this. This is still true. <laughs> Yeah. Or and, something unrelated. Yeah. And a lot of the parentheticals are my favorite parts uh, yes. as far as blurts go, but there are there's a ton of them. Yeah, it's very digressive, yeah. and he's really uh, hanging out with himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, right before the preface, there's a dedication in memory of Kurt Vonnegut Sr., who is his dad. And then also uh, there's a prayer by Samuel Johnson from Samuel Johnson's actual diary where he's basically praying for the ability to finish his writing work. And then Vonnegut says that the... Entry, which is from April 3rd of 1753, we could probably call April 3rd Writer's Day, he feels, because it's an anniversary of Samuel Johnson writing a meaningful diary entry to him. And his work was preparing a dictionary, right? Yeah, that I think he, was I think on a he might have done other stuff, but I think that, yeah. And he prayed to God for the talent to do a good job on his dictionary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it is. It's a, yeah, yeah. the dictionary of the English language, yeah. The other thing in the preface, only thing I wanted to call out is he gives some stupid answers to stupid questions he got from a stupid interview with just like <laughs> surface questions, almost like a James Lipton interview. But the one that stood out to me is, what do you think is the most overrated quality? And he said, teeth. Me too. Yeah, that's What great. about Galapagos, though? There's like <laughs> two chapters on how teeth were the most important underrated thing. No one right. valued their teeth enough. Now that they're gone, we all like miss our teeth. Anyway. <laughs> Oh, well, I, I took it as, like, people with good teeth get too much credit and love oh, from okay. society for it. Sure. You know? Like, good teeth get you too far in life, <laughs> was my read. Gotcha. Yeah. But I do, I, it is his, like, second book within a few years to be very teeth-focused teeth in a part. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, the preface mostly sets up this book and also just what's going on in his life. He's writing the preface in January of 1991. And he is married to his second wife, Jill, and they their adopted daughter, Lily, is turning eight. And also, uh, Desert Storm is, like, just uh, happening, like, right then. Right. So, he, so we're also, it's just interesting to me in life to be reading Vonnegut books where he's starting to react to things that happened in my life. Oh, Overlapping with your childhood. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. I didn't really remember Desert Storm, but it was, like, you know, it's a thing. Crazy. I remember my dad woke us up and showed us the Green Knight vision footage on the news of the bombing of oh, Baghdad, yeah. Yeah. And it was like, this is historically important. And then cool. a similar memory was 
sitting us down to watch The Simpsons series premiering. It was like, this is yeah. historically important as well. <laughs> just such helpful parenting. Yeah. So great. He was right yeah. in both counts. <laughs> And yeah, from there we get into the chapters of it. They're like standard numbered chapters. There's no title or anything. It's just One numbers. to 21. And Roman numerals in mine. Yeah, me yeah. too. Yeah. I don't and, think it means anything. <laughs> and uh, the chapters just sort of work in different speeches and essays. Yep. And the first one is Kurt Vonnegut writing about his father in Architectural Digest and kind of contrasting and comparing his life versus his father and grandfather's lives who were architects and also like taught Kurt not to be an architect. Yes. And how at this age, he no longer enjoys writing, but he still does it anyway, because it's what he's best at. And he is like, oh, that's what dad must have felt like towards the end when he was like, well, I am an architect, but I don't really like it. <laughs> um, yeah. And then he says his favorite trick if I could give my dad an epitaph on a tombstone. <laughs> he pulls that like four <laughs> times in this book. Um, he says, I don't think he felt like he had a sad life. His epitaph could have been, it was enough to have been a unicorn. And then you're like, well, what does that mean? And then he's going to explain that in chapter two. Um, but also interesting side note in chapter one, he reveals that he didn't want to quit his shitty job at GE until he had made a year's salary set aside. And he was able to do that with the sale of five short stories. Yeah. That blows my mind as a writer who, in decades past, did focus on selling and sold some short stories to some magazines. The most I ever got was like $250. That's not... <laughs> To get two years' salary would literally have been hundreds of short stories or something, or yeah. like at least dozens and dozens. So it's hilarious to me that it used to be such a viable career. Yeah, and he because uh, he writes his dad a letter about it too and says, like, look at all this money I made on my first short story I ever That's sold. That's nuts, yeah. And, and I think even in some of Vonnegut's other writing, he says, like, yeah, that market dried up right when I was finally able to make a little money on novels. Like, I barely yeah. got off of that raft when it sank. Like, well, as soon as there were TV shows <laughs> yeah. that require less work from the viewer, yeah, that's, you know, short stories sort of got supplanted by that, yeah. Yeah, that was it. And uh, and yeah, that unicorn thing you bring up in chapter two, he says there's he uses a metaphor of his sister Alice being a maiden and then his dad being a unicorn and she is the maiden who could get his dad's attention. And so his dad really doted on her and then Kurt and his brother Bernard had to kind of do their own thing. And he says they were okay. They were fine. He says they were okay. I don't totally buy it. But Cat's Cradle subtext <laughs> might suggest otherwise. Uh, another huge thing in this book is you slowly realize even more stuff than you thought is directly from his life, like oh, in the yeah, books. Yeah. He, his words, not mine. He goes like, and for a time I worked at a school for fucked up kids of rich people, which is kind of an uncharitable way to <laughs> describe kids with learning disabilities. But I didn't know, like the dude from Hocus Pocus works at a, at a school for yeah. rich kids with mental challenges and it's like whoa i didn't know that specific thing was fr like dresden bombing obviously right but man everything so he really portrays his dad a little or at least one part of his dad as shades of the dad from cat's cradle in this i thought oh yeah i think there's a lot there yeah yeah where i was like oh yeah. that's where you got some of that resentment that you crafted into that turtle head guy character <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh and, and he says his mom was going insane at this time Right. And one of the big family problems was all the resentment around a parent going insane or getting married and not knowing they were going to go insane. A very specific and repeated theme across several of his novels that I also didn't know had any bearing in his real life. Yeah, he even, he just made it a big chunk of Hocus Pocus, the novel he did, like, as he put this collection together or, or yeah. right before. And yeah, it's such a thing from his, his actual life. Yeah. It makes you wonder if he has some experience with cannibalism that he never shared. <laughs> comes up a lot. You heard it here first, folks. Kurt Vonnegut. No, he didn't eat people. That's not true. Um, <laughs> this, uh, this chapter then has his speech in 1988 at a meeting of the American Psychiatric Association. He compares himself to Elie Wiesel, and he also uh, kind of talks about the insanity in his life and his family and then about the overall tribal stuff that we all need. There's a lot of long-running Vonnegut themes worked into it, and he's telling it to doctors. Yeah. He says most writers are depressives from families of depressives. That's his opinion. And mentions an unfinished book that he will never finish that is at least worth mentioning the recap because it's a cool story idea. SS Psychiatrist was a novel he never finished that was going to be about 
a psychiatrist working in the death in the Nazi death camps, whose job was to try and help the German were like soldiers who were told to burn the bodies and did, but were guilty about it yeah. or felt depressed and they didn't know why. <laughs> His point being that like when society is insane, psychiatrists are often tasked with molding people into an insanity that matches the state, not in making them their healthiest version of themselves. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's all. It is, I think he was right not to fully write it. Like It almost feels like a better concept to share. You know? It would have made, it's enough material for a Trout short story. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. Oh, and you find out his sis was married to Geraldo Rivera. Yeah. In Palm Sunday, he talks about how she's going to marry this young reporter who he thinks is a real swell guy named Geraldo Rivera. And then by now, he's realized Geraldo sucks. <laughs> right. <laughs> he's very, and he they've should... broken up and everybody's upset about it. It's great. He shits on <laughs> Geraldo by name several times in the book. And Truman Capote, who he apparently knew well yeah. in life and thought he was just like a pompous, middling talent blowhard. <laughs> So that's fun to hear. It's, yeah. yeah, it's always fun to hear beefs. <laughs> right, zing in the rest of the art world. From there, we get into another chapter where he has another chunk for Architectural Digest, where he talks about his father's painting career and his sister's painting career, and also the idea that all masterpieces are like finished artistically by around the two-thirds mark, and then you just have to push through to actually make the rest of it, which is a very dark idea to me, but I guess he's felt it with some of his work. He would cut the third act of every movie and every play. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> and then uh, in the same chapter is a piece he wrote about Jackson Pollock for Esquire. And my big takeaway from this section, oh, and he gives Pollock an epitaph because he loves that game. Loves it. The epitaph would be three's a crowd because he feels that, right, an artist is entering like a childlike state where it's just them in the universe playing. Yeah. And if there's any third person, it ruins the art, et cetera, et cetera. But my big takeaway I didn't know is he said, then Pollock killed himself and a young woman he had just met by intentionally driving his car into a tree on a lonely country road. And I'm sorry, but my gut reaction was, oh, well, then fuck him and burn all his paintings. I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't kill an innocent. Like, yeah, it, fine to commit suicide, but you don't kill someone you just met. Yeah, as part yeah. of the suicide. So fuck Jackson Pollock. That. That's yeah. my stance now. <laughs> That's what I got from that chapter. <laughs> Enemy of the show, Jackson Pollock. <laughs> yeah. It is also cool to the article, and Bonnie calls it out, it's like kind of a rough draft of the universe of Bluebeard. It's a lot yeah. of the, he said like, oh, by researching this, I decided Bluebeard is a book I could write. Like that's a space I should explore yeah. and a place I should go. So it's a lot of parts of this book are really, really interesting if you've already read a lot of Kurt Vonnegut, and sure. that's one of them. Yes, that could be the subtitle of this book, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or the front blurb. Really interesting, dot, 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 if you've already read a lot of Kurt Vonnegut. <laughs> Chapter four. Oh, it's our old pals, The Architectural Digest. Yeah, he wrote he wrote for this magazine a lot. I know. And I don't know that I'd heard of it before. And he what's way into it. He does say that uh, he thinks in retrospect he might have liked writing for The Architectural Digest so much. Out of spite for his dead dad. Yeah. <laughs> because it's like, you told me I could never be an architect, but now I'm published frequently in Architectural Digest, <laughs> dead dad. <laughs> Burn. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> yeah, so it's another Architectural Digest one, uh, but it's basically just musings on his childhood. And yeah. uh, he grew up uh, by Lake Max and Cucky and how he loves it, and he likes bodies of water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's like all vacation house thoughts and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And also talks a bit about his honeymoon with his first wife, Jane, because mm -hmm. they spent it there and she read the Brothers Karamazov to him there. And, and so there's some nice like personal life color to that. And then he does end it at, at the end of that piece. He says all the stuff about, about his dad, I'm yeah. owning my dad by writing <laughs> yeah. for these guys. Not um, in the piece. It would have been funny if published in Architectural <laughs> oh, Digest yeah, yeah. was Peace Out, Dad, Burn. <laughs> yeah, right. In the parenthetical commentary, he's like, I probably did this despite my dad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> From there, he gets into more thoughts about himself and also just how much psychological freight he's been dealing with. And then he puts in his intro to Nelson Algren's book, Never Come Morning. He did an intro for it. I haven't read the book and I don't really know Algren's stuff. Me uh, but it's mostly about anecdotes of meeting Algren in life and also meeting Salman Rushdie and other writers along the way. Yeah. Uh, chapter five is just like a roundup of name dropping all of his writer friends who have died and various associated materials. 
Yeah. Like, here's three paragraphs I wrote about what I think about Hemingway. Here's a speech I gave about Joseph Heller. Here's a thing about Algren, who I have not heard of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because it also it contains a speech of two Hemingway scholars in Boise, Idaho, a few years earlier, like late 80s. And, uh, yeah, he talks about Hemingway's overall significance. And I have read a lot of Hemingway, so it was neat. Me too. Was yeah, cool. that was good. Yeah. yeah, and how the need for Hemingway's type of war story is fading from culture and why and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, on from there, then we get into a lot of stuff about Catholic requiems. He went to went to one in nineteen eighty five. Didn't like the English translation of the Latin. Well, it was so... Andrew Lloyd Webber's requiem. Yeah, famed writer of many many musicals, Evita. <laughs> that's true. And yeah, it's more yeah. significant. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. He really he famously wrote new music for the classic requiem, Catholic requiem, and yeah. it was unveiled in New York. And as in part of the show in the program, they had the English, and Vonnegut was like, oh, I never knew the English translation. And as he read it, he's like, this is awful. Because <laughs> it's really medieval. Yeah. Like, you, no one knows this when they sing along unless they're a Latin scholar. But you're singing shit like, you know, and if we step out of line, God, please plunge us into hellfire and like, and the dead shall be tormented. Or like, and our right. enemies shall be driven before us. Like, he didn't like... Because the Latin is the ancient actual translation. and the English yeah. is medieval. Like, it's right. not yeah. fresh. Yeah. <laughs> So he he said he went home and like that night rewrote it like he just dashed it off and then within a few years later he had his English translated into Latin by a Latin scholar and then they premiered his version of it in 1988 and then at, at a the Unitarian end of this, church <laughs> right <laughs> and then at the end of the book you'll see all the different texts of all these things yeah weirdly the whole chapter about his requiem doesn't include the requiem and it's like if you really want to read it it's at the end <laughs> yeah he's like I know this is this whole chapter is silly Here yeah we go. yeah and then seven and eight are a pair of treatises on the first and second amendments respectively yeah um which i thought were very well done they actually yeah they were the maybe the best part of the book to me yeah they're just very logical good debates and they're very illuminating about what those amendments really mean and without trying to convince you of my political belief structure because that's not the point of this show I'll just say I agree with everything he says. And like if you don't if you only have a shallow understanding of exactly what the first and second amendments mean and don't mean, educate yourself on that. This is one way. I also recommend uh More Perfect, the podcast Jad yeah. Avonrod does. Yeah. They just released a very good breakdown of all right, here's what the Second Amendment meant. Here's what they thought when they wrote it. Here's what we don't know whether it means. Here's what's left vague, and here's what's clear. And you should just, if you're going to argue about gun control on either side, you should know what the fuck you're talking about. And same for the First Amendment. Yeah, absolutely. Like this NFL shit, on both sides, most of the people talking seem like they don't understand what the First Amendment actually means <laughs> legally. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so this would be a good primer for people like that. Yeah, and because in particular, Kurt is very text driven. Like he looks, he goes into the exact wording of both amendments down to the word. Yeah. And that's worth doing no matter what you think about anything. So those amendments are out there. And it's really, well, I have blurts from there later. It's very well sure. done. From there, he has a chapter, chapter nine, where he talks about finding a church to marry his wife, Jill. And also a, he talks about a Festschrift, which is a, an incredibly German word for like a document of poems and writings and things that you give someone for their birthday from yourself and other people, uh -huh. you know. And then he reprints his own preface to his own Festschrift uh, writing about her. <laughs> and then it ends with a poem that he had John Updike write her. So it's all like a love note kind of thing. And surprise, surprise, Alex. Brett and I have this fest trip for you right ah, here. It's so German. <laughs> Why? It's all in it's German. Just, yeah, I can't read it. Pictures of you and Lederhosen. We Photoshop. <laughs> Schmidtoberfest. Schmidtoberfest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like the fest trip text he included. It's basically like just reading a nice birthday card from Kurt Vonnegut to his wife. Yeah. Not a ton of content. Well, and there's also, I in prepping, especially for Hocus Pocus, before I learned about his life at this mm -hmm. time, and uh, there's uh, dark, sad stuff that adds a whole other layer to that chunk because a few months after this book is published, or before, it's hard to tell, but sometime in 1991, uh -huh. in a way that it does not come up in the text, uh, Vonnegut finds out that Jill Crowns was having an affair and Ow. cheating on him, and they will be separated for a few years and then reconcile and be together till the end of his life. Okay. But knowing that, this made me very sad, this whole chunk. Yeah. 
Sorry, you're seeing me stare into space and wondering what's up. I was trying to think of a Festrift pun related to infidelity, but it's not going to pan out. I thought there was something behind it. No, me. you're like, is something wrong with the recording? No, I'm trying to pun. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, the, and, and <laughs> no value judgment, people cheat. Uh, Vonnegut had affairs too, but uh, but that that like truck is coming his way as he publishes and writes this thing. Nice. If you know about his life. I mean, not nice. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and the yeah. birthday card ends with a sonnet by John Updike about how Jill is a nice lady who's very admirable. I just, it's amazing that your friend is John Updike and he it's writes in your nuts. birthday card. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's the thing you hear about like a famous musician has a birthday party and three other famous musicians play it. You know what I right. mean? Right. Like, like Lou Reed's just thing. like, he's yeah. a little ditty. I wrote for your birthday, mate. You know, like, people would fucking <laughs> kill to. Right, yeah. like it's Elton John's birthday, and here's Adam Levine. <laughs> yeah. uh, now I'm I'm Don Pardo again. Yeah. Counting crows, uh, <laughs> four. There are four crows. <laughs> That's what that band did, right? I'm familiar with their material. <laughs> yeah, it's all it's it's all ornithology. They paid paradise, and there's like seven crows. <laughs> It's just really good at counting crows. Yeah. Local ecosystem census. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Chapter uh, 10. Chapter 10. <laughs> uh, we go from the secretly dark chapter to a f just openly somewhat dark chapter where he talks about his own suicide attempt a bit, which happened in the 80s and which he is in his writing very casual about all the time. But he, Vonnegut, attempted suicide and then was locked up for a bit and, and cared for him back out. And then from there, he gets into Indianapolis and its origins and how it was all geometric. And then also talking about his relationship with Bernard V. O'Hare, who, is, who yeah. this book is a little bit about. If this book is about anything, it's sort of tied together from time to time by Bernard V. O'Hare stuff. The book is not about anything, I would say. Yeah, yeah, I'm <laughs> it's stretching. It's just musing. It's also chapter 10 when I first mentioned him, so it's yeah. not really about him. But um, it comes up a lot, and O'Hare had just died when this came out. But yeah, a lot of Bernard war stories and the buddy system, and just, just good war stories. It's fun to read for that reason. Yeah. Um, yeah, segues into a speech he gave at the National Air and Space Museum. Which was funny because, of course, they wanted him to talk about all the rockets they're using to do amazing things in space exploration. <laughs> and he gave a long speech about how all the rockets that are used to drop bombs on poor people all over the world. Yeah. And he said, like, yeah, they didn't really care for the speech. <laughs> That's the end of that chapter. <laughs> he also he <laughs> opens the speech by saying, the first rule of public speaking is never apologize. <laughs> and then goes straight yeah. into a speech they're going to hate. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Great. So that's fun. And uh, then chapter 11, he talks more about POW days and a few other people he was... In the context with. of, in chapter 11, it's just an odd thing. Volkswagen, <laughs> as part of like an ad campaign, asked yeah. him to write a letter to people 100 years in the future. And his, of course, if you've been keeping up with the show and Vonnegut's work, you know, his is like... Hi, everyone who's dead. You'll all be dead a hundred years in the future. The earth is destroyed, I Sorry, bet. Sorry, you're dead. How's it going? Yeah. <laughs> like, it's not a rosy picture. Yeah. Because also, the other thing in this chapter is a piece he did for something called Lear's Magazine, which I've super never heard of. But he brings in a children's story by James Thurber where there's a royal astronomer who says that all the stars are going out because the astronomer is going blind. That's why he thinks that. And then talks about how... People are royal, are royal astronomers about the world, and he doesn't want to do that too much, but the world's going to end. It's over. <laughs> well, that's, yeah. I think that's one of the only new concepts that I really like from it, and it's not from him. It's from James Thurber, yeah. which will be in my recommended reading. That's a great book. But, yeah, so he uses royal astronomy or royal astronomer to refer to the phenomenon that is totally real that I call, like, golden age syndrome, I guess or good old days, where as you get older, so many people are guilty of just by default thinking things used to be better than they are now. Yeah, right. Just because you're right. confused and society's different now, so it feels uncomfortable. But your discomfort is not the goal of society. Right. And times change, pops, and like, oh, well, it'll yeah. happen to all of us. So yeah, he calls it royal astronomy, where like just because you're getting old, you're like, Kids act weird today. I bet the world is going to end soon. <laughs> a lot of people feel that way. <laughs> yeah, and he doesn't want to and does. He does. He's guilty of it. I underlined like eight things in the book after that and said, this is royal astronomy. <laughs> he's totally <laughs> guilty of it. Yeah. <laughs> From there in chapter 12, he has a speech he gave at MIT in 1985, 
and it's a graduation speech, and he talks a lot about how there's a lot of wisdom in it about choosing your path in life and what that means for you and for the world. Yeah. Then we're right yeah. back in with Architectural Digest. Yeah. Oh, and he, well, and he also he brings Mary Shelley into that one and also yeah, says that, that science could use a version of the Hippocratic Oath. Like which is a, a version, great takeaway. Which is yeah. a great pull, yeah. Yeah. But you could see, um, what's that Val Kilmer movie, Real Genius? Uh, sure. Same same message, either one. I haven't seen Take it, away. actually. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't be evil with science. Yeah, yeah. it's just like, because he says it's a, it's a broader idea where... All doctors do that oath, no matter what they're up to. And there should be some version of that for science where all scientists will try to do right. Right now that we have yeah. nukes, like the least you could do is have scientists who are graduating in the field of like particle physics could say a little ditty about how like, I'll try not to make anything that would wipe like earth clean of human life. <laughs> yeah. It's like maybe that would stick in some of their minds and, you know, yeah, yeah. see them through some hard decisions. Yeah, because uh, yeah, I think yeah. he also says it would not save the world or anything necessarily. It would just be a good move to try. Like, just like be, there's yeah. still evil doctors, but you can't. Right. But I think he makes a good point. But like, because we accepted this idea of the Hippocratic Oath and it is expected of them, when a doctor's evil, it seems especially evil. Like Dr. Mangala is one of the scariest Nazis of all because he was a doctor and he did all that shit. Yeah. It's like the reverse. So he's like, and yet we don't expect that of scientists, but we should. We should say like, you have the power to split the atom. We expect a lot from you. Right, right. Although by that rubric, I guess Einstein would be like a shitty dude. <laughs> um, <laughs> Enemy uh, of yeah. the show, Jackson Pollock, Albert yeah. Einstein. Our enemies list grows, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, yeah, next, back into the Architectural Digest. It's his that old saw about folk societies. He yeah, waxes poetic about how he wishes he lived in a folk society. We need folk societies. Shout out to University of Chicago. I'm not going to go into it too much because you should get it by now. Yeah. Um, he uh, also, yeah, and it's called Skyscraper National Park, which is very slapstick. Slapstick ribbons. Yeah. And then... Apropos of nothing, he just has two really great factoids in here that I didn't know. One is that if you're an old faithful and it's not erupting when you want, <laughs> apparently if you drop a box of soap, like laundry soap, down the hole, old faithful will immediately erupt. I guess because something with the water tension changes, I don't know. Or it's not true, but he claims that that's a true fact in yeah. this. And he also explains the etymology of the word limey, which I didn't know. We call yeah, British people yeah. limeys because they were the first sailors to realize you need vitamin C to not get scurvy, and they would suck on limes on sea voyages, and everyone thought they were foolish and yeah. that that wouldn't work, so they called them <laughs> limeys disparagingly until their teeth rotted out of their head from scurvy and they couldn't talk anymore. Right. Um, and then the joke was on them. Then the, yeah. Cool factoids. Yeah. If you like factoids like that, I cannot recommend enough a new podcast my brother just turned me on to, The Illusionist. With Helen Zaltzman. Do you oh, know I, I haven't heard it. It's just all short, like 15 to 20 minute pieces about etymology of different words, history of words, language, language, language. It's good. Oh, illusionist. The <laughs> illusionist. <yeah. laughs> and also at the end of chapter 13 into 14, he talks about neoconservatism. And it's like, oh man, Kurt, welcome to the modern day. What a yep. thing. And he uh, says that neoconservatives want to be British aristocrats living 100 years ago. And then he does a preface for the new Franklin Library edition of Hocus Pocus, which must be like the second edition. The book just came out when this was written. Yeah. But he, in it, talks about a lot of different things, among them being that Hocus Pocus was an attempt to deal with and criticize neoconservatism and its imperialistic approach to the world. And about how he met Meryl Streep one time and Walter Cronkite. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty There's cool. There's a lot of those too. It's funny because he even takes time out to shit on shows that he feels aggrandize British imperialism. Yeah. Like if he were alive, he would be writing think pieces that are anti Downton Abbey. That was, yeah, exactly. Because he's yeah. like, I hate all this PBS masterpiece theater shit where they make it dignified to be of the serving class. <laughs> I'm like, man, you wouldn't like Downton Abbey. It's so good, though, Kurt. <laughs> yeah. I've had that thought about those kind of shows. Like, I see what he's talking about. Sure. It's, it, there's yeah. something, I don't know if it's on purpose or not, but there's something gross with that. All shows that are like cyclical in format. You always get a sense of the resolution in most cases comes from a return to normalcy, whatever right. the system is. Right. Although there will be like a big change because it's a drama, but everything else returns to normal. Yeah. Um, but someone got bit by a zombie. You know, like one thing will change. <laughs> That's the episode. So like, yeah, in shows like Downton Abbey, the return to normalcy is an implied like, 
oh, thank goodness we're back to the class system where there's the downstairs and the upstairs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's good we've preserved this well into the 20th century sure. now. We've done it. Yeah. And you're right, man. It, it's notable how much he knows what's going on in the political landscape. Like, he really calls a lot of stuff in this. Like you said, yeah. one of the greatest things in my lifetime is the appearance of racism having gone away somewhat or being less socially acceptable. And he says, but it could still be there under the surface, and a populist demagogue could easily bring it back with, yeah. the, with a snap of his fingers. Right. Good call, Kurt. Well, right. well called. Correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, because we pulled out with Hocus Pocus, he was talking about Fox News style pundits in 1990. Like, yeah. he's, he's really on the ball for these political and prejudice based <laughs> movements. <Yep. laughs> the things which have come to pass. Yeah. Which makes you scared about the fact that he also predicts in this book that the tipping point for the environment is over. Mm, Even yeah, in his lifetime, right. he he went to his grave believing with certainty that the earth will become poisoned. We will all die off, and that's the end. And he means soon. So that's interesting to right. know. He doesn't. Yeah, he doesn't. He went to his off. grave as a doomsayer. Yeah. Yeah. When he, because also in this chapter, he has an essay he wrote for the nation, and he says that America's most nurturing contribution to world culture is Alcoholics Anonymous, which he said before. That's a Kurt trope. Right. And then he says that. Our leaders and a lot of people in civilization are addicted to war preparation, and they need an AA for war preparation. I guess yeah. it would be WPA. Not war is <laughs> itself, because they don't want to go fight and shoot people and get shot at. Right. But they love the idea of building up our army so huge that no one will fuck with us and having the best laser no matter how much it costs. Yeah. Yeah. And that's and, a huge problem. <laughs> and we keep making this equivalent of alcoholics, or, or unreformed alcoholics, uh, our right. leaders. <laughs> yes, and he said, although the difference is with an alcoholic, all they need to quiet their addiction is like a $20 bottle of booze, and they only hurt themselves and like maybe their family, right. who will miss them or be disappointed. But for a war prep addict, they have to requisition $3 billion of fighter planes <laughs> yeah. to get a hit. Like, that's a hit for them. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> There's a great XTC song called Generals and Majors that explains it. Oh, Explains that's great. it all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then I think, I guess to lighten it up, he ends chapter 14 on his new winner of the funniest joke. If you recall, he had a pretty mediocre joke that he declared <laughs> the funniest joke of all time, which was, what was it? What was the previous winner? I don't remember. Yeah. That's how unfunny it yeah, is. Yeah, it wasn't good. And then he declares a new winner for funniest joke that's displaced that one. And it's fine. Also, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's something about firemen. I think that's why he liked it. Is that, I have a thing, I don't know if it's just me, a lot of times I'll read like interviews or biographies or something of old comedy writers, like old comedians, yeah. and someone will be like, and this was when he told the greatest joke ever, and here's that joke, and it's never funny to me. It's always very, very flat on the page, and it doesn't work at all. And I'm like, oh, has comedy moved on, or does it like die in print, or at least this kind of joke they did, or, or what is it? Like, why doesn't this work? <laughs> I think there's been a major tectonic shift from vaudeville to naturalism. Yeah. Yeah. I think too. it's because yeah. the classic guys would be like, I built a joke. Yeah. Set up, set up, set up, punchline. Isn't that a cleverly constructed joke? Right. And now everyone's much more into what Sein I mean, Jerry Seinfeld helped usher in in a huge way where it's like, hey, do you ever notice? Let's just look around. Let's talk about that. This person in the audience looks dumb. What's your deal? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they're always like, can you, and then when he landed this joke, it changed the landscape right. of comedy. And it feels very like, ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba -ba. like a joke book like, joke like, is no right. longer in style. Yeah. yeah. Even though they're wo all the same rules are woven in. Like if you saw Patton's new special Annihilation, it's great. I haven't yet. Well, he knows how to build a joke and all of those structures are in there, but they're couched in the modern like oh, sensibility great. of a story. You know what I mean? Whereas he, later he'll say, yeah, Rodney Dangerfield told me, and Rodney Dangerfield's fucking hilarious. Yeah. But he told me the joke he thought was the funniest joke of all time, and it reads like a popsicle stick joke. Yeah. It's like, why did this happen? Because of that. And you're like, that's not that funny, Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> Back to school is much funnier than this joke. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Thank it's you. about that firemen. That helps. That makes sure. sense. Yeah. <laughs> not even to tell the joke. I do want to tell yeah, the dirtiest funny. joke of all time. Th that right? one's actually very good. That one is funny and made yeah. me laugh out loud. Yeah. <laughs> well, into chapter 15, 
It leads with Vonnegut doing a sermon at Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City. And he talks about the idea of fates worse than death. Title like, track. Oh, here we go. <laughs> and uh, in particular, the idea that when we're all afraid of science killing us with an H-bomb or something, that bomb can't make you deader than dead. Science can't make you more dead than a dead person. So if that bomb's going to kill us all, that's a way we could go, but it's not even the worst way. Well, yeah, from childhood, I've always told myself that when I was scared. Like a ho- if I thought, you know, Worst when I was young scenario, enough to I see die. a horror movie and be like, man, w- you know, you're empathizing and you're scared of monsters because you're a little kid. And you're like, what if I'm in that situation? That always works. Is I was like, yeah, well, this thing like eviscerates all these horny teens in like a second or two. I, I just wouldn't. It would just be over, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then you grow up and you realize. Oh, but shit way worse than that happens to people constantly as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, like he, your manner of death can stretch out years sometimes, and it's awful. Yeah, because the one he makes an elaborate case that if all of us were being individually crucified, literally crucified, it will be good to have all these hydrogen bombs around because then we can all take that like a cyanide capsule and like just if, hydrogen bomb ourselves if aliens come to stop being all. crucified. But that's, I think, just en route <laughs> to his he's main kidding, point. But yeah. I think he's kidding because basically you're saying, well, what would be worse than death? Well, torture, then death? Well, yeah, but that's just additive. He arrives at the main fate worse than death is enslavement. Yeah, And yet, it is baked into the human nature that even slaves don't commit suicide by and large. Yeah. Like, no matter how bad your life gets, you want to, to go on another day. By and large, most of us. Obviously, some people commit suicide, but they're in an extreme minority. Yeah, Even among people who are, like, horribly oppressed. So I think his point is that it's, I mean, it's not a happy point, but that slavery yeah. is even worse than death, and yet... People don't kill themselves just become the, because they become slaves. And isn't that fucked up? And we should stop enslaving people. <laughs> yeah, it's really a lot of his speeches in this book. I can't imagine a crowd sitting through them. It's crazy. Very uncomfortable. Like, doing yeah. this as a speech, especially in a giant cathedral in New York. like. Well, and then he also oof. talks up television as a positive, which is super funny. Because it's the same way I've seen a lot of people I admire talk about the internet. And he's like, at least now because of TV, keep in mind Vietnam is fresh the freshest war in his mind. Yeah. Um, now, because of TV, kids going to war, unlike in World War One and Two, they are not under the illusion that it will be fun and clean and nice. They already know it's part of the culture that war is hell. There's even a lot of movies and shows about how war is hell. And he says, that's great. Now kids will not want to do war because they'll get faced with the hellish part first. Yeah. Then what's funny is the speech ends, and in the narration that's not part of the speech, he immediately goes, that was so wrong. I'm so full of shit. I can't believe I said that. That's so dumb. Just the opposite is true. Now I believe TV totally desensitized. And you've heard this argument about video games, anything. And I don't even know if I agree with him, but I think it's funny that he flip-flopped. He's like, now that I'm a couple years older, I actually think TV is Satan. It desensitizes <laughs> you to violence and does glorify it and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, because one of my favorite parts in Bluebeard, which is not even very plot-motivated, it's just a great Vonnegut thought, is that there are other depressions and world wars happening, and now because of mass media, we just don't notice them. We're just distracted yes. by other stuff, and we don't, we just let it go, and which I is feel, fucked up. I feel that's true also about when he says, one of my greatest joys is that racism seems to have greatly declined in my time. I'm like, yeah, but you're a wealthy white male. Right. And I know you have empathy for the racism you come across, but you probably just aren't in a lot of situations where you witness the racism. I'm sure it, yeah. it has not declined as much as you think if you're just going by your experience as a 70-year-old famous writer who lives <laughs> like, you know, in a small like gated community in Long Island. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and also that it has declined, but maybe don't be so excited about it. Now it's just declined to just some lynchings yeah, or some yeah. terrible, you know, it's still awful. Yeah. <laughs> but the chapter definitely made me think if he had lived longer, he would have been like, wow, the internet, it's going to save everything. And then three years later would have been like, nope, you ruined it. <laughs> the internet sucks too. <laughs> you maniacs. Yeah. He even in this chapter, he talks about George H.W. Bush, the older Bush, being our the first president in Vonnegut's lifetime to win on a nakedly racist campaign using a black psychopath as a boogeyman, which is referring to the Willie Horton ad he, uh, Bush ran against yeah. Dukakis to win. 
And uh, he says that if Bush had done that with an Armenian or Pole or Jew, it would have made him a Himmler type person. So he's even in this stage of American history mad about openly racist campaigning in a Nazi fashion. Right. Like, man, <laughs> you think there's people out there who feel like or who are on the left side of the political spectrum are like, Trump now makes me think George W. wasn't so bad. Vonnegut thought H.W. was too conservative, so I guess he is pretty left. <laughs> yeah, and, and that H.W. was like the gutter. that like said, It was yeah. the bottom that we like, could reach. If Vonnegut were alive to see Trump elected, I think he would just kill himself. Like, I don't Kinda, even know yeah, how yeah. his brain could have handled well, this cause slide. Because we'll, <laughs> when we get to A Man Without a Country, we'll get into how he dealt with the younger Bush and how he felt about it. But like, yeah. that's the furthest we know. Like Because he uh, Vonnegut died in 2007 and, and missed uh, this, you know? Missed this party. <laughs> but yeah, so this this book is extra fascinating in terms of today's politics. Because it's he's talking yeah. about a stage before as being the worst things could get. And I'm sure most of our listeners aren't aware of the Willie Horton ad. It's worth looking up on YouTube because it is like surprising. Steal yourself. Campaign ad. Yeah. Uh, but you are probably familiar with Sideshow Bob Roberts, the Simpsons episode where they have an ad where he is let out of a revolving door prison over and over. That's a parody <laughs> of the Willie Horton ad. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, I always love learning history only because it deepens my knowledge of Simpsons references. <laughs> In uh, chapter 16, he talks about, oh, this, this fits too. Uh, it's a speech at a Unitarian Universalist gathering in Rochester, New York in 1986. Vonnegut talks about the militantness of Christians going from Constantine in Roman times to the Nazis to now in the 80s and um, compares Unitarian Universalists to the early Christians hiding out in Rome like outlaws hoping for a better world under their beliefs. Right, and he says, uh, even though the names swap around and now there's a group that calls itself Christian that is the dominant group in this land, the people who are truly Jesus-like are always in a persecuted minority. And now he, he says, like, you as secular humanists, essentially, or spiritual humanists, are the real Christians, like you're the yeah. ones who are trying to be altruistic and self-serving because you think it's beautiful and the right thing to do. And he says, by and large, Christianity is completely diverted from that path yeah. and is not really Christianity. And he, uh, it's an interesting thing he lays out where he says, it's because media, he hates media. <laughs> he says media now shows us 10 times out of 10 the beautiful failure of Christianity. That's what drives drama. Not, you don't get a movie where the karate kid says, I don't want to fight, and then he doesn't fight. Or, you, you know, you don't get a show. Yeah. What's that show with the karate kid wandering from town to town? The movie's karate kid. What's the show? Kung Fu. See, it's even before your time. All know. right, fuck it. Walker, Texas Ranger. Oh, there you go. Walker, Texas Ranger walks into town and goes, <laughs> I don't want to fight. Then the show doesn't end with him not fighting. Oh, right. That yeah. would be what Jesus would do. That would be a Christian parable. Unless you're watching Veggie Tales, what usually wow. happens is a human who is so despicably evil that they're basically an animal fucks with Walker, Texas Ranger to the point where he has no choice but to blow their head up with a roundhouse kick. And that is, <laughs> so he says, our media is about how Christianity ultimately fails. The good man must always draw his sword and chop the head off the evil man. And even our hero tales still suppose that there are people out there who are scum and animals who deserve to just be crushed. Yeah. And he's like, why? I like, I mean, I know why. Humans are just awful. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> but he's like, so hats off to you for not falling into that trap, basically. And he says their logo for their church should be a bologna sausage with the Ghostbusters no sign around it. No baloney, <laughs> <laughs> which is just just a hilarious piece of graphic design. I was thinking it. that could be my tattoo. Oh wow! At the end of this run, I want to get a Vonnegut tattoo, and that's in the running now. No a baloney, because no <laughs> I feel like it would start a lot of conversations, and I'd get to t explain Vonnegut to people. Yeah, that would be exciting. Because yeah. they, you won't know that it's a Vonnegut reference. <laughs> You'd be like, what the fuck is that? Be like, are you yeah. vegetarian? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then a uh, fun fact from this. He has a lot of fun facts embedded in here. Sylvester Stallone was apparently a girl's gym teacher in Switzerland to avoid the Vietnam draft. Yeah. Which, Good work if you can get it. Well, it sounds like just a funny side note, 
but he points out that it's actually pretty despicable, and I agree when you consider that he immediately came back and made a series of movies called The Rambo Franchise. So, like, without living through it and without experiencing the hell of war, he avoided the draft, then came back and pumped children's brains full of the idea that Vietnam was rad, you go there and you blow up bad guys, you're fucking right. awesome while you do it. Our it's commanders amazing. let us down, we could have won. And even in the first <laughs> Rambo, they tried to make the ending, he gets killed at the end because he's just crazy and it really is about how war is hell. And the studio made him change it to Rambo wins and lives and now he goes back to Vietnam and wins Vietnam. Right. So like, Sly really uh, is complicit in some fucked up shit. Yeah, big time. It's Vonnegut's contention and I agree. Yeah, especially just knowing that fact, because that, that never comes up. That's never yeah. a thing you hear about. Yeah. What a guy. Uh, <laughs> and then we take a left turn, sort of, into Chapter 17, where it's his Parade Magazine piece about a trip to Mozambique, which I didn't really know was in the throes of an ongoing civil war that was just utterly brutal. Yeah. And also kind of a proxy Cold War thing. There was a Soviet backside and then an American backside that was great. Widespread famine. Yeah. It's everything you'd expect from a tale of starving refugees i don't know what to add when it, he, all, he it's also just a travel it. piece about how horrible things are there at that time yeah and he connects it to a piece on a trip he did to biafra that's in palm sunday the previous version of this book and he says that the biafra piece like broke him emotionally like he was weeping in a way he'd never even wept about world war ii and then when he did this mozambique trip he just appreciated it intellectually like biafra broke him and now he could see these awful massacres in africa as oh that's an awful massacre in africa yes let's document it but you know, and that's just because the human mind is so adaptable obviously i yeah. don't think it means he lost his soul or whatever right for, right yeah. yeah for more on that topic i can't recommend enough cracked gets personal's recent episode about fixers in the middle east yeah yeah, yeah it's yeah. great way better than this podcast you're listening to now <laughs> but just about of course and and people ask how could the nazis not be animals well because you too if forced at gunpoint to shovel bodies into a great mass grave, eventually it stops bothering you so much. Yeah. You still understand it's wrong, but it doesn't have the emotional impact. That's just how the human brain works. You can get used to anything, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. 18. 18. Well, I, and I'm, I'm reaching for my book because yeah. this contains uh, his favorite dirty joke from his Russian translator. 18 does? Rita Wright. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. And uh, it's a very good time. It's right toward the beginning. And the limerick is there was a contest to come up with the top dirty limerick. Oh, can, no. Can, may I? Yeah, Do you sure. mind? Go for it. May yeah. I? Because the whole point is he says Rita Rate does it in a Cockney accent. Oh, That's yeah, what yeah. makes it so great. Yeah, you can get into it. Yeah. All right, all right. You're ready. Let's do it. Oh, so this British millionaire died, right? He left this <laughs> enormous prize, all these pence and quid and whatnot, to anyone who could write the best dirty limerick. Some bird from down Devonshire. <laughs> anyway, this chick wins the limerick writing contest with the dirtiest best limerick. It's so dirty they won't publish it. You know how jokes work. Three times someone comes to her and says, tell us the limerick. And she goes, no, it's too dirty, even though I won the contest because it's so witty. They go to the publisher, tell us. No, we agree it's the best one ever, so we gave her the money, but it's too filthy to publish. There's some third person asks her, and she goes, all right, all right. I, I can't say it. I'm too much of a lady. And they say, fine. Say the limerick live on the air because everyone wants to know it. Oh, it's Winston Churchill himself asks her too. Oh, Who yeah, cares? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he goes, but just say... Da -da. the limerick live. Right. That was Nixon kind of, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> he says like, just say da-da-da-da-da-da for the words you need to bleep, right? But yeah. people could get the shape of the limerick or maybe divine the joke, you know, even if kids are listening in, they won't know. She goes, all right, all right. So he goes, da 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 da
I, I'm not remembering it. It's one of the greatest episodes of a sketch show because it's a concept episode. Obviously, like, Mr. Show and Kids in the Hall will develop this, but Monty Python really only did it once or twice, and one of the best ones is an episode where someone writes the greatest joke ever written and reads it to himself and laughs so hard that he dies of a massive heart attack, so they, like, deploy it as a weapon of war. Anyone who oh, sees it yeah. on a sign yeah, starts right, laughing right. to death. Yeah, right. <laughs> and the really soldiers good. are, like, holding it up. It's woven through the whole episode. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's some of these essay ones are so good for related stuff because it goes everywhere. It's right. Great. He uh, he also Vonnegut talks more about translators. Says that translators should get the same royalties as authors, and that when he tells that to publishers, they act like he's crazy. And then he does a speech to a gathering of translators at Columbia in 1983, and talks about the first translations of his works and what he looks for in one. And uh, and also interesting stuff like I don't know that this fact is true, but he claims that. Every translator has had to retitle his book Jailbird. I think that's fascinating. Yeah, because other countries don't have the horribly constructed prison system and recidivism that we have. Like, they don't have the concept of somebody who keeps going in and out of jail because that would be stupid. Understand that clearly. (laughs) No other culture, if Vonnegut is accurate, has a single word that means... Someone who just got out of jail and is destined to go back because they're on parole or whatever. Someone who's in and out, in and out. Yeah. Because no one else fucking does that to their populace. Right. I mean, people do horrible shit, you know, Saddam gassed the Kurds. But we also do horrible shit. And one of the worst things we do is we put the largest percentage of our own citizens in tiny boxes of any industrialized nation by far. Yeah. To the point where we have a word that other cultures don't have that means, oh, yeah, one of those many millions of people that we just put in jail. Yeah. And they're like, I guess we call it the the jail book? I don't know what to do. Yeah, someone ended up calling it gallows bird in one language. And he's yeah. like, that's not fair. They it's can totally only hang different. you once. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, I like that. Burn. <laughs> And then another side fact, apropos of nothing, because it's an essay, I didn't know Ferris wheels were originally invented as military equipment during the Civil War. Yeah, me neither. You would load a bunch of dudes with rifles into a Ferris wheel, and when they got to the top, they'd take a shot, and the next guy would come up (laughs) and take a shot. That's amazing. Yeah, that almost felt made up, too, just because it's so crazy, but maybe it's true. I googled a little and found other citations about it. Oh, for real? Yeah, yeah. but I don't know if he introduced that idea and then was just (laughs) quoted, you know? Yeah. But it's amazing, anyway. There's a lot of Civil War war equipment also that didn't pan out. That's amazing. I encourage you to, like, look a little into Civil War weapons that were designed and never deployed or, like, failed in testing. They're awesome. There was this idea someone had to fire two cannons side by side, and the cannonballs are attached by a chain. We have these now. It's called daisy cutters now. Oh, I think I've heard of it. Fucking grotesque. The idea being that the chain will cut everyone in half. Right. Like all your enemy soldiers will be ripped in half. And they're like, yeah, we want that. Um, (laughs) But the problem is, it's Civil War times. The only way to time the firings of the cannons was like, okay, three, two, one. We both fire our cannons at the same time. So the first time they tried it, they fired at slightly different times, and it spun around and around and around like a bolo and, and killed, killed a bunch of guys. people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they didn't proceed with that. Like, I love the idea of the pre-nuclear era where they're like, how can we make weapons of mass destruction when we don't know anything? <laughs> 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 like maybe a yeah. sword ball and we roll the ball down the hill. Yeah, yeah. and all the tech is like iron and rope. It's, it's amazing. Like, well, how yeah. do we kill everyone? Steampunk shit, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And then uh, the, like, end note after that speech is Vonnegut says, five months after the speech, he tried to kill himself. It wasn't a cry for help. He wanted out. He just wanted to be he done He just wants living. to make the point that he's not a drama queen. He really meant to kill himself. Yeah. And then he did. He woke up because he failed, and he never again felt the need to kill himself. But that doesn't mean he didn't mean it at the time. Yeah, because then start of the next chapter, chapter 19, he talks about Ray Bradbury's short story, The Kilimanjaro Device, which is about a man. And go- Alex popped the uh, boner of all boners. And I <laughs> fell in love with this book at that point. It was so great. But he talks about how that story is, is a fictional story about a guy with a time-traveling pickup truck trying to go and prevent Ernest Hemingway from committing suicide, and Vonnegut wonders if his whole life now after that suicide attempt is because somebody, like, 
saved his life or he'd really be he's really dead and he's just imagining it or something it's a really interesting thought experiment where it's he's the like, last season of roseanne he thinks yeah. he's dan from roseanne <laughs> <laughs> if you're unfamiliar at the end of the penultimate season dan on roseanne has a massive heart attack john goodman and then the last season he survives the heart attack and the family wins the lottery and then in the series finale they're like no that was all fake he died when he had that heart attack identical idea which yeah. i just thought was cute it's body gets like saying stuff like if i had lived and not committed suicide i would have given this speech at this event here you can read it but of course i didn't because i killed myself yeah which is crazy uh, bizarre <laughs> and the the first speech from that is in the spring of 1990 it's an essay in the new york times not a speech but he says in the essay he writes about the idea that comedy writers lose their sense of humor at a certain age um, he also says that writing gloomy humor is pretty essentially American. He's just kind of balancing, oh, how far have I fallen into gloom and can I still do humor or is humor right. how I have to deal with it? And he says he even canceled a college speaking tour in 1989, the previous year, because he was just being incredibly sad on stage. I think he, he, read back, blowing it. he read back some of his speeches and had the thought we had, which is like, man, who wants to sit through this at their graduation ceremony? Yeah, how it's would you do bleak. it? It's pretty bleak. Yeah. But I believe it, so I don't know what else to write. Yeah. <laughs> um, and says that, interesting side note is that Hocus Pocus was intended to be a sardonic comedy in the same way that like cats, like just as funny as Cat's Cradle, where like, oh, it's right. horrible, but it's also like weirdly wacky. And he's like, and it just didn't come out that way. Hocus just Pocus sad. is just gritty and sad and there's no jokes. And that's true. And he's like, and, and I used the same process. I must just be... It's not funny to me anymore. I'm old enough that I'm over the joke part yeah. of how horrible shit is. He <laughs> talks about uh, Mark Twain's urges to kill himself. And I think very insightfully points out that I don't even have the tool Mark Twain had, which was a get out of jail free card that writers no longer have, which is at the end of Huckleberry Finn, a catalog of everything that was wrong with his society at that time. Truly disgusting things like racism, slavery, etc. Yeah. Huck Finn famously lights out for the territories. And that makes you feel like, oh, it is a comedy. Because you can imagine in the Wild West with whatever unknown variables there are, Huck Finn might have a great adventure and everything could be good there. Yeah. And he says, now we know every square inch of the world and it all sucks. <laughs> or like, there's nowhere on earth where it's going to be like an entirely different social structure where humans act different. Yeah. Everyone's the same everywhere you go and we've explored the whole world. So my books end with like, and then he was stuck there or he hung himself. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have Huck light out for the territory. Yeah. Yeah. Especially thinking about Mother Night's ending. Yeah. It just ends that way because he can't go to like some new chunk of the world. Right. It's all been Nazi or not. And Jailbird just is. goes back to jail. Where can they go? Yeah. Yeah. Space, I guess. That's why Sirens is the best. It's slightly hopeful. Oh, yeah. It's the, space. It's the only That's one the that posits possible space travel, yeah. Yeah, good old Sirens. <laughs> That's also amazing in that essay. Then this chapter has another essay, which he wrote for the Cokes and Brentano's Bookstore's Christmas catalog <laughs> in 1990. Okay. I don't totally know why he bothered. Single-handedly uh, kept them afloat. Now the world's largest Christmas catalog, as we all know. <laughs> the K&B. <laughs> yeah. Who doesn't use it? But he, uh, it's very short, and he basically talks about his experiences trying transcendental meditation, especially when his first wife, Jane, got way into it, and then says that he found uh, meditation to be sort of a nap, but then he finds that reading is his true transcendental meditation in terms of having an amazing experience and you know going into himself and understanding himself. I just want to say transcendental meditation works for me. So I disagree. <laughs> and it, he says it works for his wife. Like his wife yeah. saw incredible, amazing experiences. And he was like, why is that just kind of a nap for me? That's yeah. weird. Reading is great, but it's not the same as meditating. And I thought it was weird that he tries to equate them. Yeah. If one you, is about yeah. activating your lobes as much as possible. And the other one is the opposite. <laughs> I feel like it's the, his opinion was the kind of propaganda you would put out if you're a bookstore. Like, to help I sell guess. Books. Yeah, like, his point <laughs> is to sell books. So yeah. Of course. So I don't, I don't know if that went into making it sure. but that's his bit here yeah and then he talks about abby hoffman as a clowning genius and other saints of comedy and other saints he's known in the world and he also includes a letter that someone named dean brellis wrote about 
his wife, Jill Kremitz. So Vonnegut did not write this letter and is not really in this letter, but it's about Jill Kremitz being a photographer in Vietnam. She was a professional photographer, among other things. Yeah. And this other guy describing his wife as a saintly figure in Vietnam and even says that the North Vietnamese had a list of he, he of calls do them not kill he calls them round eyes in the letter which is racist not great uh, but uh, he of people that the North Vietnamese apparently all agreed to not kill and she was on the list so look at her I don't know how they identified her on site like that's Jill it all, Crimmins it all sounds everyone like a tall knows tale. that yeah yeah it's it, none of it sounds in the midst real. of this war <laughs> This in, this guerrilla army that's highly fragmented yeah. all knows Jill Kremens is that lady. Yeah, right. There's two things we know about the Viet Cong. <laughs> yeah, They're yeah. completely decentralized, and they've agreed not to kill Kurt Vonnegut's wife. <laughs> that's how they work. <laughs> but yeah, that's that chapter, and it's the appendix and ending bits of the book will have a lot of other Sense. writing by other people. And oh, this and, is the first and a lot of where. It that seems like the bulk of the book is about how in his old age he's become, if anything, even more depressed and cynical. Yeah. Even though he urges children not to be cynical, he's like, yeah, try and fix the world. If you did, I'd be pleased, but I'd be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you don't have to be cynical, but I'm cynical at this point. Everything's pretty depressing. And then he's like, of course, many people have asked me, is your point in your books, like, we should all kill ourselves? Or why... Do you not try again to kill yourself? Like, why do you continue existing? Yeah. And so at the end of the book, he's like, of course, there's good people and good times. And I'm going to call out a bunch of people I call saints. So yeah. um, the book, I think, to sort of end on a lighter note, wraps up with just like a lot of nice portraits of people in his life that he's like, but this person's great. This person proves humanity's great. So does that person. <laughs> yeah, which is nice of him. I'm glad he did it. Yeah, yeah. Then in chapter 20... I think he's done citing stuff in these last few chapter chapters, but he has tips for young writers. And he also in chapter 20 says that he has always moralized in books. And there are other famous books where people moralize, and that seems to be a good way to go. So go ahead. Well, he and do says that. it's the only way to uh, live on for a thousand years. Yeah. Um, because if you write about the way your life is around you, it inevitably becomes dated. But if you look at stories that just have a moral imperative that's very lopsided and clear, like the Bible or books of philosophy, yeah, they're just more timeless. It's really just like it's <laughs> it's a functional advice for writers if they want to write a mortal work. Yeah, it's yeah, because this is also not... the and this is also the chapter where he says that writing is a job that's come and gone from him, and it's just a job and it's just a trade. And like especially people who grew up with the Great Depression, like they get their job, and if they lose it, they're like, oh, time to get a new job. Well, yeah, here we go. He also arrives at one of the basic observations about art that was revolutionary to me and has guided my work very much so which I learned from, friend of the show, Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics, which I've plugged before, yeah. um, where he says there's two types of artists. Artists who are interested in the content itself, the story, and artists who are making art that comments on the medium itself, mm. the history of the medium, how it's been used. For example, a Jackson Pollock painting is a bit of both, but it's more on the side of when you see it at the time it first came out, you would see a Jackson Pollock painting with someone of art history who has knowledge of art history, and your first thought would be, this flies in the face of structural conventions. Yeah. Not which character does that yellow splotch represent. <laughs> it's not content-based. It's f called formalism. And I just yeah. think it's really interesting that in every field people wind up at that. It's like true, 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 and it's good to know which one you are if you're an artist. For example, uh, Abe Epperson told me at USC Film School, they teach it as there's two types of filmmakers, the elephant and the termite. Elephant art is dealing with the elephant in the room. So, like, for example, taking friend of the show, Ryan Coogler, the great Fruitvale Station is elephant art. It's talking about what's really yeah. happening in real life that's the topic that's important to the film team right now in society. Then there's termitic art, which is like a Lars von Trier movie, which is like a bunch of kids sitting in a dirt lot talking in an unstructured way that almost feels like, is anything going to happen? Did you just <laughs> set up a camera? You know what I mean? That's like slice of yeah. life or fucking with the conventions like Memento would also be formalist. It's a bit right. of both, but... Part of the value is like every other thing going on is different from this. This is a whole new way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just very, very pleased that that thing I learned from Understanding Comics is echoed again here yeah. by my hero. I keep, uh, it's true. It keeps popping up. Yeah. yeah. And then in chapter 21, he 
gets a lot into his life as a German and also what that means for his way of thinking and his cultural place because he says that before Germany was unified, we got all the good German ideas. And then once Germany was unified, we got all the bad German ideas, yeah. uh, like Nazism. But before it was, we got things like free thinking, and that was where his family came from. And then he ties it to his... Not just the... That's with a capital F. It's one word. There was a group yeah. called the Free Thinkers, which is like the Quakers. Like, they weren't as religiously affiliated, but it was a group of people who tried to engender secular humanism and altruism. And then as soon as they're like, yeah, but you come from the Nazi country, it really <laughs> came out of fashion to join the free thinkers. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Even though Any... it would be the equivalent of like, Girl Scouts, you wasn't that like founded by the KKK? No to your cookies. <laughs> like the free thinkers were all good people right. who were against right. the Nazis, but were like, eh, it's still a little Germany for me. <laughs> yeah, and that was and there, that was a whole thing with German culture in the US that finally gets written about in other In between books too, World War One and we two. kinda lost all of it. Because it was tied to the right. Kaiser and to Hitler, like, right? Even yeah. before the Nazis, yeah. after World War One, there was a. It was hugely fashionable to be racist against people of German descent in America. <laughs> right, it just seems random now. Yeah, it would. Yeah, it would just be silly. He yeah. also tells a fun story about meeting Sidney Lumet at a party. Sidney Lumet, who I know as most notably because he holds several distinctions as a director. He was the oldest living director to direct a film. He directed uh, Before the Devil Knows You're Dead when he was 93. That's crazy. And he also directed 12 Angry Men, the yeah. black and white. Like, what a career. Oh, yeah, huge range. Spanning yeah. six decades or something. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and he wrote a good book about making movies, too. Cool. Yeah. Um, I forget the title. It's called Making Movies. <laughs> so that's why, yeah, it's easy to remember. Please don't cut out the pause of you Googling that because it's <laughs> yeah. really funny that there was like an eight second pause and then you go, oh, well, it's called the movie book. <laughs> yeah, I basically said, it's a book about yeah. making movies. I wonder what it's called. In this, he says, I would cite the entire Freethinker essay by my great grandfather, Clemens Vonnegut, but I put it in the New York Public Library and the Library of Congress so you can find it there. And anyway, here's a piece of a Goethe poem that he ended it with because I think it's meaningful. And then from here, he winds down into an appendix of the book with other chunks of things other people wrote and then also his commentary on them. I, I say winds down even though it's a lot of pages, but there's a lot. Of, now we're in kind of the B-sides of the B-sides of the clip show at this sure. point. Yeah. Can I read you my note synopsis of chapter 21? Yeah, sure. Uh, this is just what I wrote to remember like vaguely what it was about. I'm German, comma, free thinkers, comma, Sidney Lumet thinks I'm a Nazi, comma, humans are screwed, comma, Rodney Dangerfield told me a car wash joke, comma, <laughs> here's a poem by Goethe. <laughs> yeah. That's He's how really, all over the place this book is. We're just getting to the odds and ends of it. Yeah. yeah. Because, yeah, the appendix then, he... It's had... mostly stuff that he's referenced throughout the book. Like, he says uh, the story about the Requiem, and then he goes, and indeed it's true. In the appendix, you will find my Requiem in English, my Requiem in Latin, and the original Catholic Requiem in English. Yeah, yeah. It's also, and then, uh, yeah, it's just other things like that. There's um, when he, earlier in the book, has a speech to psychiatrists. He says that his son, Mark, wanted him to tell them other stuff. And then, so he has what his son, Mark, wanted Included to say. Included as a postscript, yeah. And it became the afterward to a new version of Mark Vonnegut's book, Eden Express. But it's updates on the state of psychiatry and about vitamin therapy. And Vonnegut then tags onto that by talking about how there's a generation of people who missed Vietnam and had World War II type consciences where they wanted to help and didn't get to use them. And so that mm -hmm. is a, a struggling thing for them. He then also, he pulls a piece of something called On Literature by a writer named Carol Capek. And it's a little essay by Capek about how when Capek was a small boy, he could go through his town and see everyone doing their jobs, like the blacksmith and the grocer and the local prostitute and everyone else. And that writers don't seem to have that visibly exciting work from a perspective like that. And Vonnegut says, yeah, that's really interesting. I wish I could be inviting to people as I'm doing my work and showing them how it's done. Uh, mm -hmm. That'd be a nice thing, which is a, it, now we're just like meditating with Kurt at this point. Like we're just hanging. I'm out. not going to help you out with the appendix, man. Yeah. You're scraping the bottom of the barrel. I feel no need to recap 
the eighth postscript of the Yeah, book. it's all right. <laughs> we can skip to the very last thing, which is... Vonnegut. Uh, yeah, I take it back. The very last thing in the appendix. And it's like two pages. Yeah. Uh, Vonnegut says that after one of his speeches about religion and the world, he got a letter from the dean of the chapel at Transylvania University. Spooky! Yeah. It's an actual college. Uh, I think it's in Pennsylvania. And he was asked what he actually thinks of religion and faith. And Vonnegut says that the Bible's useful for connecting with fellow Americans on some kind of shared cultural thing. And also it contains contributions from at least two geniuses, Moses and Christ. And then Vonnegut says, Jesus taught that life is hard for losers and an essential skill of being alive is showing grace in your failure as a loser. And then the last line is that what I can't stand are sermons which say that to believe in the divinity of Jesus is a way to win, which I think really speaks to his whole thrust that he's getting at with Christ in the That's my last note as well. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, that's a spicy book. It's a spicy fate's worse than that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and off of that quote, I think we can get into a segment called Kurt Blurt. What you gonna do when he comes to Blurt and he's got it on his shoe? This is a segment where, if you've never heard the show, we pull out particularly choice lines and moments that a summary doesn't hit in the book. And uh, yeah, this one, it's like these essay collections. It's uncut. Kurt speaking directly to you. Like, usually with these, I look into his letters of the time, and I did with this one, but this one's sort of just a book of his letters to you, the reader. It's mm-hmm. all it's all there. And I chose not to, even if they're amazingly enlightening, I chose not to include quotes that I felt were already points made in previous books, just repackaged. Oh, man. Must be, yeah. So I have very few. I, I don't have that many either, yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. I think I unconsciously kind of did that too. Did that yeah, there's as well, a lot of yeah. chunks of this where I'm like, yeah, I've seen that. Trick. Well, the worst one is he had he has this great in Hocus Pocus. He just had the epitaph for the planet. We could have saved it, but we were too damn cheap. Short, punchy, good way to phrase it. And in this, he ends one of the essays with, yeah. And while we're getting on the topic of epitaphs, I might say an Earth epitaph could be something like, "We were cheap," but then I might add to the beginning. <laughs> It's what we could have saved. I'm like, you phrased it way better before already. Before and also, the earth. He like breaks it up and makes it much more clumsily phrased. I don't know why. Yeah, that really bugged me. Especially because he wrote it like last year, you know? Right. It was so recent. Just copy and paste it from the word doc you must have. (laughs) Uh, All right. Quote. Paint and weapons have more in common than I previously realized. They both suggest to their owners surprising and noteworthy things which might be done with them. Yeah. Spooky. <laughs> I think he ends a chapter with that, too. It That's really a good pays one. Off. Yeah. Uh, this is right in the preface. He says, a preface is commonly the last part of a book to be written, although it is the first thing a reader is expected to see. I don't know. It's just solid thought. It's not, it's not <laughs> yeah. particularly vodka It's just like, oh, yeah, all books work that way, don't they? Interesting. Uh, movies, too. Or, I mean, now that it's interesting now that opening credit sequences are usually an elaborate animated thing. That's like the last thing worked on. But it in some cases, really gives you an impression of the movie. (laughs) Yeah, big time. Quote, I was lucky to have been born there, meaning Indianapolis. Then in parentheses, Charles Manson wasn't lucky to have been born there. Like so many people, he wasn't lucky to have been born anywhere. (laughs) (laughs) And that kind of is a repackaging of stuff he said in Jailbird, but I still like that packaging. Yeah. That like, hey, let's be honest, there are people who lead lives that aren't worth living. Yeah, for sure. And that, uh, it's in Rosewater and a yeah. few others too. Serial too. killers among them, certainly. This actually, I, I will do this one then, because this is also sort of a Rosewater thing, but not. Human beings have almost always been supported and comforted and disciplined and amused by stable lattices of many relatives and friends until the Great American Experiment, which is an experiment not only with liberty, but with rootlessness, mobility, and impossibly tough-minded loneliness. Yeah, to me, see, that's like Kurt's spark notes on Kurt. <laughs> You're like, yeah. yep, that's a recap of what I already learned by reading your many books. <laughs> <laughs> he yeah. would do a good, Kurt could teach a good course on the works of Kurt Vonnegut, which oh. not every writer could do. He understands everything he's doing very that's true, clearly. Actually. Yeah, because <laughs> also we see in his letters and reactions, like he really pays attention to his critics. Right. And I think that gave him gives him cognizance of himself in a way that probably doesn't help in some ways, but when he's analyzing himself, he's ready. Right, and he's a way that a lot of artists, it. I don't think, or feel like they'll ruin their vibe or the magic of whatever it is if they yeah. self-analyze. He doesn't feel that way. He's totally figured out his whole toolkit and what it is. Because, and I do he think knows it, can be, <laughs> it can be kind of ruinous to spend too much time with your critics, even if they're positive. Like, it's just not that healthy. And he, I 
don't think got too unhealthy with it, but spent a lot of time on it. Yeah. <laughs> Quote, we are simple-minded creatures, glad to believe on the basis of symbolism alone, up is better than down, that air superiority is moral superiority. After all, look where God lives. <laughs> and I think that's true that there's fundamental things about language and culture that we take totally for granted that affect us more than we think. And he's pointing out one interesting one, which is that it's easier to bomb people than shoot them, A, because you're farther away and not looking in their eyes. Yeah. But also, B, because you're like flying through the clouds and you feel like you must be on a godly mission from above, which I never thought of and is also probably true. Yeah. You're like, how could this cause not be good? I'm in the plane dropping bombs. They're the tiny ants down there in the dirt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really, it's even, I think there's one or two hardcore histories where Dan Carlin's brought up the idea that, remember, these ancient armies were stabbing each other in the face. It's way it was more of a deal. And, yeah. And in some ways, it's more honorable, because if you were ever going to take a human life, you had to know what it felt like to take a human life right. by like stabbing do, them uh, in the face. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Say in the same speech, he says a little later, a woman said to me after that speech, no one should ever be bombed. I replied, nothing could be more obvious. <laughs> I just like it as a quote because it's like, and the unspoken thing is, and yet here we are not being able to figure out how to stop bombing each other. Yeah. Like how can we, everyone knows that like, you know what would suck? Having a bunch of explosives packed into a rock and then it dropped on your village. But we cannot stop doing it. <laughs> yeah. Another one from the speech to psychiatrist, he's talking about how medicine works in a basic way. And he says that every doctor's probably had this thought. I am so sorry to have put you, my patient, on the outside of a pill. I would give anything if I could put you inside the big, warm life support system of an extended family instead. Yeah. Which is a cool quote, but also I like that. I really love that conception of when we take a pill, we are putting ourselves on the outside of it. Yeah. It's a really weird and Fun cool... with prepositional phrases. <laughs> ...way to stack things. Yeah, it's cool. Or to have things stacked upon... I lost it. <laughs> I just thought this was an amazing image that I can't believe they didn't use in the movie version of Slaughterhouse-Five. He says about the bombing of Dresden, you should have seen the giraffe in the firestorm. I did. Like the escaped giraffe from the zoo... Yeah. Like Whoa. on flames running and charring this bizarre image of a thing with such a long neck in running through the streets of like a European town on fire. Yeah. Man, how do you not put that image in the movie just from a filmmaking standpoint? I actually That's think That's amazing that you saw that. Even though Slaughter up now. Even though Slaughterhouse 5 is good, the movie version I mean, it yeah, is it probably is. the best Kurt movie. I still think we're due for a remake. I think it could be done even better. Oh, probably, yeah. yeah. Well, because also that Slaughterhouse 5 movie is very good, but also pretty pointedly working within its technological limitations. And dated and we can at this just point. do it. Right, exactly. Full on. Kurt needs a lot of better movies. His stories deserve better movies than they've had. Yeah. By and large. Come on, the world. It's going to happen. Yeah. It His will. time's coming. Yeah. This is one, when he saw it's my favorite bit of the otherwise kind of flat stuff about his vacation homes and things. He says, no matter where I am, and even if I have no clear idea where I am, and no matter how much trouble I may be in, I can achieve a blank and shining serenity if only I can reach the very edge of a natural body of water. The very edge of anything from a rivulet to an ocean says to me, now you know where you are, now you know which way to go, you will soon be home now. Home in your kingdom of the sea. <laughs> <laughs> and Poseidon yeah. comes again. Come on to the sea. <laughs> Do you read Perry Bible Fellowship? That web yeah, I'm thinking okay. of the You're thinking strip. of the one? The yeah. Okay. If you don't know what we're talking about, we won't go into it, but look up King of the Sea, Perry Bible Fellowship. We'll link it. <laughs> and then read all the other strips. It's yeah. the best. Great. Yeah. Nicholas Gurwich. Quote, if people think nature is their friend, they sure don't need an enemy. Very famous Vana quote. Vana yeah. Blurt just wanted it in there. Yeah, this actually, this one, I felt like it didn't have a ton of famous ones. But that one I yeah, had heard many times there. before, Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, sort of the anti-quote to the one you just read. There is one thing from childhood I miss so much that I can hardly stand it, which is freedom from the certain knowledge that human beings will very soon have made this blue-green planet uninhabitable. Yeah. So that's that. He has weighed in on that issue. <laughs> and this is in 1991, so. Right. It's not even, yeah. Yeah. Couple you got his ago. you got his prediction, and he's been right about an eerie number of things over the course of this podcast, so I'm worried. <laughs> yeah. You Stop got it, more? Kurt. I got three more. Uh yeah, I have a couple more, yeah. Cool. 
This is because his stuff about the First and Second Amendment is really great. When he's describing just the basics of the First Amendment, he says, he reads the text of it and all the different elements, and he says, What we have there is what should have been at least three separate amendments, and maybe as many as five, hooked together willy-nilly in one big Dr. Seuss animal of a non-stop sentence. It is as though a starving person, rescued at last, blurted out all the things he or she had dreamed of eating while staying barely alive on bread and water. <laughs> Right, because it was a compromise between all the existing political factions who were like, you have to say this phrasing this way, Yeah. because in our state, it means that, and we want that. Yeah. Yeah. So the point being that, like, I don't know. Yeah. It's full of, that, <laughs> that one First Amendment has almost all of our liberty all stacked up in it. And, and you know, you never really think about it. It's just like, of course, freedom of speech and religion and the press and other things. And it's all like, in one. shouldn't those each have been separately yeah. dealt with and more specifically and clearly? <laughs> right. Because now there's all this room for argument, as we see. <laughs> I love this, though, how he, he says he would tweak the Pledge of Allegiance. And this is before all this NFL take a knee, I stand up, put your right foot in, right foot out, hokey pokey bullshit. Year, decades before, obviously. But I love that this would solve our current NFL problem. <laughs> <laughs> he says the pledge is stupid. Yeah. It's, not, it's stupidly phrased. It should read, I pledge allegiance to the Constitution of the United States of America and the flag which is its symbol. Right. If you think about that for a second, you morons. It fixes the whole thing. That's the whole problem we're having. Everyone's yeah. like, by taking a knee, you're disrespecting the flag because the first words are, I pledge allegiance to the flag. But why think about it even further? Why did we do it that way? You shouldn't pledge allegiance to the symbol of the thing. Pledge allegiance to America, bitches, not, yeah. not this piece of cloth that you wear on your sweatpants and bandanas anyway. Because right. also, because the people who are mad at kneeling athletes seem to believe that the flag specifically represents our troops in the field. And that there's a legal obligation different. because of the way it's phrased that, like, you must salute the flag, that yeah. object. And that's just not fucking true. And so the sentence is phrased confusingly. Right. Obviously, the important part of the allegiance is you're pledging allegiance to your interpretation of the ideals that form the community that we call America. Right, the basis the of the country itself. The flag has almost nothing to do with it, except that it is the symbol. The green piece of paper in your wallet is not the value that money is. It is a symbol of it. <laughs> you morons! <laughs> Hashtag take a knee. <laughs> I'll come down on that side. Yeah, me too. This is a one really choice bit of his MIT graduation speech, which is one of the less dark, I think, public speeches he gives in the book. But the line is... It can make quite a difference, not just to you, but to humanity, the sort of boss you choose, whose dreams you help come true. Yeah. And that's in the Hippocratic Oath one, right? Yeah, it's in the Hippocratic right, Oath so one. Right, so it's the scientists. Don't yeah. be a henchman. <laughs> but Because he, he builds up to that by talking about how his brother Bernard graduated from that school, MIT, in 1938. So he says, like, if he'd been in almost any other country and gone with that country's government, he could have worked for Hitler, Mussolini, Tojo, Stalin. You know, like, it, he chose to work for yeah. an American company in America, and that made all the difference. And that's what we know about. Nazis, right? They started as human beings. <laughs> yeah, many so of them you want to you want to think that their brains were somehow different, like a German Nazi from World War II, because you want to think that could never be done to you. But the majority of you, yes, it easily could. There's a, an inexplicable minority of people who can be in a situation that all of society agrees upon and still go, no, you're all wrong, this is nuts. Because, right. we, of course, we saw people, even German people, speaking out against Hitler as he rose. Big time. But not you, listener. Odds <laughs> are you would have been a Nazi if they made you. Yeah, most people, most <laughs> yeah. people go along. Yeah. Yep, unfortunately. Quote, In many of my books, including this one, individual human beings are not the main characters. The biggest character in Hocus Pocus is imperialism. It's just like, if you heard that sentence before you read Hocus Pocus, it would be a very handy key to reading Hocus Pocus. Yeah, absolutely. Elsewhere in this book, he says Hocus Pocus was his attempt to write a modern-day American Don Quixote, which is very interesting because I didn't get that at all. So now I want to yeah. like compare them and read things from that. So just interesting tidbits. Yeah, it also it, it sort of suggests that the that Eugene Debs Hartke, the main character in Hocus Pocus, is not supposed to be either not supposed to be heroic or not supposed to be someone we see as put together. If it's like Don Quixote. Well Don know, Quixote was cool. heroic but delusional in thinking that he could actually affect change. So that yeah. could be the message, yeah. That's cool. You're tilting at windmills and windmills are not the problem and you can't kill a windmill. 
Right. It's yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then the last blurt I have is he describes Columbus war on the native peoples of Central and South America. And he just ma- says something we all know, but I think it's phrased beautifully. When executed on a smaller scale, such an enterprise is the crime we call armed robbery. <laughs> <laughs> like, we came to where you live. We have weapons. Give us your stuff. But we did it to a million of you, so yeah. it's okay. It's a societal shift. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. And we're going to force you to be our religion, so that makes up for it, right? (laughs) Yeah, just another crime we do. Um, I think I have three more. Maybe I'll just run through them. Do it. One of them, this is from when he's talking about Skyscraper National Park, Manhattan. He says, Manhattan is a geological phenomenon. An enormous fraction of the planet's wealth was concentrated on a little island of solid granite. This caused crystals to sprout in such profusion that the island, when viewed from the air, now resembles a quartz porcupine. And that that recalibrates my whole concept of New York, Very a place cool. I lived at one point. It's Made like, me yeah. remember the last time I was flying over New York, and I'm like, it does look like that. Next time I'm flying over New York, I'm gonna think that consciously and look down. <laughs> yeah, well, you can even you can even get that if you go up the Empire State Building. Like I, I did that one time when my parents visited for the mm. first time, and I was like, yeah, this will be fine. You know, yeah. we'll go up the tall building, but it really hits you with the amount of sculpting and constructing that has been done to that space yeah. in a colossal way. It's really cool. Another line, this is when he's talking about translators. He says, and he's making fun of himself in a good way. All I require of a translator is that he or she be a more gifted writer than I am. And in at least two languages, one of them mine. Right. Yeah, Which right. is a great like cell phone about the importance of translators versus authors. Like they're such talented people. And then uh, the chapter, the whole chapter about, American humorist, because he also in that chapter draws on a book called Punchlines by William Keough, which I haven't read yet, but it argues that violence is an essential part of American humor, because partly because we live in a violent society, and so we have to get that out somehow. But Vonnegut's talking about why American humorists make fun of our flaws as citizens, and he says it's because they have their own concepts of ideal citizens. Quote, dreams of ideal citizens are as essential to our humorists, in my opinion, as they were to, were to Karl Marx and Thomas Jefferson. Which yeah. it, it really, it gives a lot of gravity to humor writing in a way that a lot of times people are like, humor writing is one of the most noble professions. And I don't know if that's true, but it gives, I think, the proper gravity to it of yeah, people are making fun of our dumbness because they want us to be better and they feel like they can see a way. I think it's also a side effect just of the overlap of the two jobs and that they trade in symbolism. Yeah. A very simple way to construct a joke is, you know, but I'm explaining to the dummies out there, yeah. uh, is uh, a sudden juxtaposition of contrasting elements. And you can only do that with elements that have a strong polarity, so to speak, or charge in a particular direction. Yeah. Classic example beginning sketch troops often make sketches about Hitler being nice or Jesus being a dick because everyone knows Jesus is the opposite of a dick and Hitler is the opposite of nice. It's easy to work with. It's easier to work with Abraham Lincoln because there's like four traits that you think about versus like whatever that Stanley Algern, that obscure author he mentioned or whatever. Yeah, (laughs) Nelson Algren, yeah. You you could make a joke about Nelson Algren. Someone would have to research Nelson Algren to get it and go, (laughs) I guess that's funny. Um, So I just think it's interesting that, yeah, comedians will reach out for highly charged symbols in the same way that Thomas Jefferson did, but for totally different reasons. I don't buy that it means humor writers are noble. I think it's just an overlap in job skills. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I think not all of them are, but it's a thing where some of the time when they're being satirical specifically, it's it's not just because they want to insult all of us. It's because they also believe in that th- the idea that things could be better and that things could be different. Well, as a satirist, may I just say, no, I'm empty inside and I think you all <laughs> suck. And I've just found a job where I get to make fun of you for a living. Yeah. Ah. I'm just insulting turds. That's what's on my business yeah. card. That's just because I suck and you spend so much time around me. (laughs) Michael Swain, turd burner. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, these are good blurts. This is great. (laughs) Uh, We can go straight into a next segment called Kurt Vonna What? Whenever Alex says this is great, he's really mad. (laughs) He's going to hit me later. You burned all of my turds. (laughs) I was saving them. Turd saver. (laughs) Turd saver. (laughs) <laughs> I just thought of Walker, Texas turd saver for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah. What, yeah. what, what? what this what, is what? Uh, where we what, pick what, out what? things that may be offensive or just problematic or whatnot to acknowledge them and notice them in the book. And this is the first book 
where I, because some people, I think most of you get what we're doing. Obviously, we love Vonnegut, or why would we be making? Why would we be making this fucking thing? <laughs> right, we don't make it to destroy him after his death. But you get that you still need to be critical of thought. And uh, I think Vonnegut would agree. I think he would not mind that we have this segment in the podcast. Because yeah. he says, I find uncritical respect for works by great thinkers of long ago unpleasant. Because they almost all accept it as natural and ordinary that females and minorities and the poor were on earth to be uncomplaining, hardworking, respectful, loyal servants of white males. The underlying point being... Times change. Even great thinkers can fuck up and say something problematic, and you can call them out, and it's fine. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. and he, yeah, he, especially in these later books, starts to either call himself out or, or the characters call something out in, in a novel. You know, it, yeah. It's start, he's starting to be, uh, he's growing with his times as much as he can. So that wasn't a Vana What, but it was on the topic of how we justify doing Vana What. Yeah. yeah. He also, in this book, he says explicitly that he's like unpacking his own fear of women. And we've been picking out, especially when you picked out in Bluebeard that the protagonist could have been the female character. Yes. Uh, like he, he seems to be realizing that he is not good at writing women because of some kind of deep seated fear or something yeah. yeah i don't want to steal your blunder thunder do you have some of those because i I have those collected what do you oh like uh his oh, problems just, with women <laughs> yeah there's uh there's a couple of them that he does not call out and i think are just a thing he is talking about his time at the national air and space museum and after his speech and he's talking about a female museologist which i think is a someone who works at a museum yep a, um, like a curator but he's just talking about them speaking to him and bothers to do an aside where he says like great legs God, by she's the way. hot yeah which i don't know that's not necessary and he <laughs> goes like uh, there's some rumor this guy's gay he's not though trust me ask his wife marlena dietrich god what great legs she has yeah <laughs> that's another <laughs> similar one but well, and just yeah. one other big women thing is when he's talking about humor writers and he has a really interesting idea where he says that insurance companies could start giving policies to humor writers for when they run out of humor and aren't funny anymore and he and that's a fascinating idea to me but then he says like chris Catan could have like totally pulled in bank after we all stopped caring yeah. about chris Catan. <laughs> if he had this insurance he could come and be like see i'm still trying hard they just don't care anymore give me my money yeah. right like i've Pay lost out the policy. i've lost the thing because i've aged like <laughs> yeah. you know like you have insurance for when you get ill because you aged you know um, so that's fascinating. But then af immediately after that, he says that the actuaries at the companies would find that this loss of funniness hits men at 63 and hits women at 29. And I don't know if he's slyly trying to say women face more challenges, so they lose their humor faster. But it's without further explanation, and he doesn't give further explanation. It sure sounds sexist. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. and because he's also, he's gingerly working feminism into this book directly mm -hmm. and right. trying to be part of it. And I think he... Does he? Uh, my my read on that age thing was like on some level he thinks at that age women get more feminist and that makes them not funny anymore, which might be an overreach by me. But there's a lot of different ways to read it. It's Only one great. of them is charitable; the rest are unflattering. So it's not yeah. great. And then yeah, <laughs> all the other women. His two female archetypes tend to be empty-headed, beautiful women. Yeah. And then like the other type of woman, and these are not real women. These are just generic women he's creating for an argument in the moment but like he calls them a fat old woman picking her nose right a gimlet eyed divorcee gimlet is a drink so like a drunk lush yeah like he always just describes women as not great unless yeah. they're super hot in which case the great thing about them is how super hot they are and once they're unattractive they're usually disposable in the plot or you know, crazy suicidal yeah he literally this is a quote that bothered me a lot my theory is that all women have hydrofluoric acid bottles up inside yeah i'm like well that's clear by the way you write them <laughs> but that's not true <laughs> yeah and it seems to come a lot from his mother and stuff yep. like he should he should he's realize working that's mother very issues personal. through his women yeah. yeah and then he calls the fact that he's become more pacifistic as he aged fruity and feminine <laughs> yeah <laughs> and last but not least he says margaret mead was once asked when it was men were happiest she's an anthropologist and she said when they're starting on a hunt with no women or children along and he said, I must agree, don't you? Nope. <laughs> I think, like, I'm way happier in a communal situation. Yeah. I'm way happier with ver a variety of people with different life experiences and perspectives around. I just don't share his idea of what is a nice environment. Right. right. I also find his idea of folk societies as an obsessive ideal problematic to me. Because I genuinely am bored with 
a bubble of people that all think the same as me. I don't understand why we're alive if not to be stimulated by being challenged and getting new information and crazy alters of perspective. Yeah, and yeah. if you live in a folk, he always says, how amazing would it be to live in a folk society where everyone's the same race and believes the same thing because there's no other types of people. And I'm like, well, that's basically just a call for racial purity. I don't want that. Yeah. There's, there's an extreme point of it it's, where like, you like can go too far with that shit. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's like modern day white nationalists who go into the woods with just other white nationalists to be survivalists. And because Kurt is then not, they can just be around white people. Kurt is not pro them, but it makes me yeah. uncomfortable that his ideal society overlaps so much with a Klansman's notion of an ideal society. Well, their constitution yeah. would be different, but they both agree that boy, wouldn't it be nice to just live in the woods with other people exactly like me? And I don't agree with that supposition. I don't, I I think his folk today is more driven by the numbers of it than. Like he just wants a small group where everybody cares about each other. I, I don't know that he necessarily needs it to be also the needs a sameness to make that work necessarily. He literally says a group of people who all have the same skin color and think the same thing because there's no oh, yeah, because well, no one's ever argued against it. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, that makes it easy to get along. Yeah, but I don't know that the goal of life is just to be eat. like you hear that you know the standard of living in Norway is the highest in the world. Well, yeah, they have basically a mono population of people who are all the same race, religion, and social stratus, and they just don't disagree about a lot of things. Right. That's easier to fun make it function, but that doesn't make it better than the melting pot model, or which yeah. we could now call the toss salad model, because you don't really melt. But genetic diversity and diversity of thought is a great strength, and it, with it comes great strife and challenge, but I think that challenge is part of what makes life worth living. I would never retreat to a folk society. That's all I'm saying. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, And he also, he clearly functioned reasonably well in New York City, like he had a lot of stuff going on in his life, but he, he's lived in giant cities and enjoyed it, it seems yeah. like. So he's, he's as much as he wants a folk society, I think he also likes having a lot of people around. <laughs> like it's and I weird... love kids and I would never want to go out on a hunt, so I'm just not like yeah, whatever yeah. person he's thinking of, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> there is, I, I think I had one other big what, which is he's taught, he gives his whole MIT speech in 1985 to the graduating class. And then when Vonnegut, the book writer, is talking about it after, he says that the speech flopped. And there's a line where he says, he's like trying to figure out why the speech flopped. And he says, there were many Oriental faces out there. Who knows what they may have been thinking? Yep. Which just plays racist. And then in the following just, chapter, yeah. well plays more than a little. Yeah, race. because I think it is racist. The following yeah. chapter, he says, <laughs> they would have clapped their little yellow hands with glee and grinned with their crooked buck teeth. Oh, I missed that. How did you miss that? God damn. That's like watching an old Popeye cartoon and going, whoa, holy shit. Yeah, yeah. This is really racist. Yeah, and he's done like <laughs> anti-Asian racism before in his books too. It's and not good. It's in a sentence, <laughs> the purpose of which is, he's like, uh, we shouldn't think this way about them. But... I just don't see how he doesn't understand that, yeah. you know, like he already is enlightened enough that he wouldn't do that with black Americans. He wouldn't go like, I'm here to respect the list of black stereotypes, but he still feels comfortable <laughs> going like, we shouldn't shit on Asians just because they're buck teeth and great at karate. Like, you're like, what are you doing, man? Right. Yeah. Like, stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then uh, I am an alcoholic and I don't know if I've announced that on this show or to you, Alex. No, I don't know. Oh, all right. Yeah. Uh, I uh, am an alcoholic who recently joined AA and have started. I'm four weeks sober. Oh, congratulations. Well, man. thank you. I deserve oh, congratulations. Wow. So I'm sharing yeah. that with people publicly now. So there you go, people. But also, th because of that, and because I've actually gone to AA a few times and have struggled with alcoholism for the last seven years, I found it problematic that he says AA is the most enduring contribution humanity has ever made. And in the next paragraph, However, I am not an alcoholic. I haven't attended AA. I've never had to struggle with alcoholism, so I don't know how hard it is or the unique challenges. Well, then how can you make such a grandiose claim as AA is the most enduring contribution humanity's? Yeah, I just feel like yeah. as an alcoholic, I have the right to say he should have had to have been an alcoholic to gauge how effective AA is. I can tell yeah. you how effective AA is because I'm an alcoholic and it's helped me. He can't. Well, or, uh, that's all a, I'm like now uh, uh, territorial about my alcoholism <laughs> no that's really fair because like well even if he 
even if he can't find alcoholism within himself, like he should go to a meeting to check it out or something. You know, like get a <laughs> yeah. sense of this thing you say is the greatest. Like, yeah. I feel like he picked volunteer firefighting and AA as symbols and he just attached to those symbols throughout his whole career. Yeah. Well, yeah, certainly with Rosewater and yeah. even before. But yeah. he came habitual at a point where I'm like, all right, all right. I'm sure there's some volunteer firefighters who are huge pricks, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But don't tell Kurt Vonnegut <laughs> that. He will not believe you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I'm out of what's as, as far as what's go, I think. I'm out of what's, and I'm sadly meatless. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm, I pretty much am, too. It, it also, it seems like, just as far as the meaning of the book, it's just all raw meaning. Like, there's not a lot else to dive into. There's nothing but meat. I feel like we've been swimming through a pastrami pile the whole time. <laughs> right, it's one of those Carnegie Deli sandwiches where yeah. you, like, can't eat it. Sky-high yeah. sandwich. You're like, oh, I don't even know how to tackle this thing. <laughs> no condiments. Yeah. It's just two pieces of rye bread and a dead pig. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I think, we'll briefly go into a segment called The Meat. Chapter, chapter, chapter. Little chapter, beef chapter, meat, chapter, chapter. you don't know what I got. <laughs> Little beef meat, you don't know what I got. You could you could really semi chipmunk it really well. It's amazing because <laughs> I do. Since we're reading these this way, in my head, I can't uh, compare it to the other essay collections and also the process of them coming together. And I felt like Wampeter's Foam and Grand Falloons came together accidentally and was really really rich. And then Palm Sunday, he almost, as we said on that episode, he almost writes a really effective treatise on Christ, like almost a C.S. Lewis kind of thing, except by a atheist humorist. Right. And this one is probably the least effective in that way because it is just things he's put together that he had from those years. And it seems, as we'll find with his last few things he wrote in his life, I think he kind of moves away from this format of thing because he realizes, uh, oh, now I really am just pushing essays together. Like it needs to be a constructed art piece like I Bless You, Dr. Kevorkian, or it needs to be Man Without a Country where I sat down and wrote it all at once. You know, it needs to be that kind of thing. Sure. I yeah. believe you. I haven't read either of those, but they're coming up. Oh, it's going to be so <laughs> exciting. It's great. Yeah. But I like this is a, well, I guess we can from here go straight into a next segment called Kurt Vonnegut Grades. G is for grades. grades. R is for raids. A is for AIDS. AIDS. <laughs> I didn't see where that was going when I started it. Uh, straight to Dades. Dade County. D Miami. is for Great Dade spot. County, Florida. All right. Great. It was about Miami. Uh, <laughs> Kurt Vonnegut grades is where we uh, look back to Palm Sunday, where Kurt Vonnegut gave himself letter grades relative to himself on all his works. And then we also ran out of grades shortly after that. And so this one will give it a grade relative to other Kurt. Also, I think it's worth mentioning that just in the middle of this book offhand, he says that Galapagos is his best book because it tackles Which the flies way the in brain the face works. of his grading system now. Like, according it, to his published grades, Galapagos is not the highest graded, is it? it so, Galapagos was after the grade list. Ah. So, he's basically saying that, sure, I gave an A-plus to Cat's Gradle and Slaughterhouse 5. Galapagos is an A-plus-plus. Plus. It's the, the leader of all books. Huh. Which is it's weird. in the top echelon. It's definitely top shelf, but I don't. I wouldn't say that personally. Yeah, I, I wouldn't either. It'd it's be very the, good, but It would be in the top six, probably. Yeah. But it would be number six, probably. <laughs> It'd be, yeah, it'd be like I can think of there. like five I like better, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, this is, uh, this is one where there is no outstanding Kurt grade for it. As far as his other essay collections, he gave Palm Sunday a C, and he gave Wampier's Foma and Grand Falloons also a C. Can we say it at the same time? Uh, and see what yeah, we, let's do it. Yeah. Three, one, two, two, three. One. Nope. Nope. Okay. okay, we'll start at okay. three. Okay, we'll start at three. <laughs> okay. three, three, two, two one, C C-. minus. Oh, close. About right. You yeah, had a plus, yeah. I had a minus. All right. Yeah, because I think it's... It's a solid C, people. <laughs> that's that's probably about right. Yeah, it's a book that there's nothing like wrong with it. It's just, the, uh, other than a few key blurts, there's nothing amazing about it. And it's also, it's, it's like he openly admits, it's pieced together from stuff he's yeah. got. My grade, actually, I wrote C is for cool story, bro. Because <laughs> after every chapter... Like, you know, there's been past books where after every chapter I wept and contemplated my place in the universe. After every chapter of this, I just went, oh, cool story, bro. <laughs> What's next? Oh, yeah. one about your son. Oh, one about your wife. <laughs> cool story. <laughs> yeah, it's about right. Yeah. And I, I gave the same grade to uh, Wampeter's Foam and Grand Falloons. They're both like 
all, all of these essay collections, there's stuff there for people like us who love Kurvana. Yeah. I also, I think this might be a little more interesting if we hadn't like done a little research about his stuff. Cause there's like some reveals in this and some things of like, Oh, Billy Pilgrim is based on his POW a friend, guy, Joe Crone. Right. Amazing. But I knew that from mm -hmm. making this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't need to know that from being amazing already. Yeah. But yeah, I, we're, we're about on the same page with yeah. that. I think. Yeah. It's essays. It's fine. And from here, let's get into a segment we've kind of done throughout the show called Related Reading. Speaking, Speaking of, being of being on the, being same, on the same page, page. Read, read what I, I read. read. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize our new goal was unison. Now we're, yeah, that's where we're going, huh? I'm going to come in next session with that goal. Yeah. We'll just <laughs> stare at your lips whenever the segments are coming up. Right. I try to say hi, Michael, and you're like, hi, hi, hi Michael. Yeah, Michael. <laughs> If you've never heard the show, we pull in other just texts and works and other things that remind us of this book that we think you might like too. And we've kind of done that across the book because an essay collection lends yes. itself to that. I have two, but I already mentioned The White Deer by James Thurber, mentioned oh, okay. in the book itself. Yeah, one, one, of mine, one, other one. one of mine is The Kilimanjaro Device by Ray Bradbury. Yep. It's directly in the book, and it's from a collection called I Sing the Body Electric, which has a couple great stories, especially one called Tomorrow's Child that I think we've plugged on other uh, episodes. So that's pretty direct. It's related yeah. because it's in the text of the yep. book. Yeah. And uh, the only... <laughs> but I have two, I have two other oh, things. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> one of them is... I don't, I don't think I've, pl I've re recommended it before. It's called The Brain Dead Megaphone. It's an essay collection and speech collection, kind of like this, by George Saunders, who is an incredible writer. He just won the Man Booker Prize for Lincoln and the Bardo, which is an amazing novel, but also other kind of work, too. It's also awesome. history and also uh, metaphysical and poetic and, and just great. Nice. Um, Brain Dead Megaphone has... A piece I think I've pulled out called The United States of Huck, which is his intro to a Huckleberry Finn. So he it's another essay and speech collection by an amazing novelist that also talks about Huckleberry Finn and Ernest Hemingway and America. And it also includes stuff from very, very modern times. Like there's an essay where he goes to a resort in, I think it's Dubai, it's somewhere in the Middle East, mm. and he just farts around the resort and has thoughts about it, and it's cool, sure. you know? Uh, so if you, uh, it's that that's almost David Foster Wallace-ish, like when mm. David Foster Wallace goes on a cruise and hates it, you know? But it's really great. He's an amazing writer, and it's his only book like this. Nice. Yeah. I'm my only remaining one is the Malcolm Gladwell book Blink, which you've no doubt heard of. Oh yeah, but I I've definitely read it. it's great. I recommend reading it because all the case studies are very interesting, and it ties into this book because he claims in the beginning of the book his sister Alice could roller skate through a museum and fully draw all the meaning from each work of art as she passed them. Yeah, because she just had such a good instinct for art. All was, she needed was, was cool the chunk. initial gut reaction. And Blink opens up with a case study about art dealers seeing a statue or painting, I forget, and most of them instantly in their gut realized it was a forgery, but they couldn't prove it or figure out why or why they thought that. And then it's ultimately revealed it was a forgery. And it was a very good forgery, but it just is one of the things that goes to show what the book Blink is all about. If you are trained in a skill, you have, your brain has incredibly honed instincts and will feed you information that will usually be accurate way faster than you even think you could consciously calculate. Not that you should always trust your gut, because if you don't have a lot of experience with a situation, you are an idiot at it. <laughs> but if you're an expert in a field, trust your gut when it yeah. comes to things related to that field. And then also, Vonnegut talked in this book about uh, why Christians find it so hard to love each other, because the exhortation to love thy neighbor seems like such a tall order. And if you can't love them, what's left? To like them? Well, what if my neighbor's a prick? You could ignore them. What's left if I if they're so such a prick I can't ignore them? Hate, I guess. And he's like, that's a spectrum. Like, saying we should love each other implies the existence of hate. Instead, we should just say respect thy neighbor because respect has no opposite other than literally the word disrespect. But yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, right. It's not set on a spectrum. Res you either respect someone or you don't respect them. And if you don't respect someone, the next step is not hatred. People don't think that way. But if you don't love someone, you kind of think, oh, do I hate them then? Yeah, that's So really it's cool. a cool argument, and they make the same point in Blink through science because one of the cool things in Blink is this study where they found they could film a couple interacting for like 20 minutes and determine with more than 90% accuracy if they'd still be together in a year without the sound on. You don't wow. even need to hear the content of their speech. And it was based on body language and facial cues 
and the only metric that they found out actually was determinative was level of respect versus contempt. You could fight like cats and dogs, but if you respected each other, like each other's rights, yeah. it was likely you would stay together and work through it. If either one, obviously, they called it, had contempt for the other, meaning, oh, they don't even value, they think that person's thoughts are nothing, or they just block them out, they're going to break up. And uh, so I thought that was cool. He, like, he's been proven out by science. That's really cool. Yeah. And, yeah, and, Gla Blink. and Gladwell's a really just fascinating writer, too. Always. Like, the way, Gla he, yeah. puts, he, the way he packages science is great. He has a great podcast, Alternate History. Yeah. yeah Very yeah. good. Very good. Well, my, uh, my last one, it's sort of a blanket kind of recommendation. It's, especially if you listen to all the episodes of this show, I would recommend checking out an early work and a late work by George Carlin. I think Ooh. we're moving toward, especially with the late, late Vonnegut stuff, but even some of the chunks in this where he tries to do a funny speech and it's just about how the earth's going to die. We're, we're moving into a period where I think Vonnegut starts to feel that in order to be honest, he needs to be just bleak some of the time. And I think George Carlin sort of had a similar process in his life, and they're both interesting artists to look at that way. And there's a lot of ways you can approach uh, discovering Carlin doing that if you haven't and uh, I think it was just some sort of early work like if you go really early with Class Clown or also Carlin on Campus is kind of a, another album that's relatively like, Hey, go real early. early you want to see the real change go on YouTube and search for a hippy dippy weatherman sketch right. oh sure yeah and then watch something like Brain Droppings or You're All Diseased it's like right these are two opposite guys who would fight violently if they met. But nope, they're the same guy just 45 years later. <laughs> yeah, the same guy and even the same art form and, and a lot of the same talent. But and... totally different style. Right. I also think it's weird to go back and watch. Uh, Louis C.K. had a really, really early Comedy Central half hour where he's standing in front of a circus tent is the backdrop. Does that <laughs> ring a bell? I, I know in general that he had like a much sillier side before he got into this habit of throwing out specials. Yeah, there was a Comedy Central Presents where he was good, but he's very like broad, classic, like yeah. 80s stand-up jokes. And it's really weird yeah. how he evolved as well. I've always thought Carl and Twain and Vonnegut are like the same guy. Oh, sure. Yeah, <laughs> they yeah. share a soul. Yeah. There's that strong... Yeah, I'd, I'd lump Saunders there too. Carlin's yeah. great. Yeah, so also if you've never just discovered George Carlin, like, get into it. Uh, but especially, I think it's good to think about his progression in relation to Kurt in this book and also where he's going. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, these are great. We uh, we would next do a segment called Vonnegut News. There's not really much... Take it back. It's not really much news. We... Oh, the effects on this one are really good. The only only thing that jumped out to me is that we... Plugged on the last episode, there's a new collection of all Vonnegut short stories called Complete Stories. That's worth repeating. That's big news. Which is huge. There's yeah. new Vonnegut material. <laughs> yeah, there's five new Vonnegut short stories that they discovered yeah. in his papers and, and brought out because they, I believe, were never published or, or published in a low-profile way. I yeah. think just never published. Yeah. But the New York Times review of Complete Stories has a nice anecdote in it. There's a writer named Jess Walter, and he talks about being a young writer, meeting Vonnegut in life, asking for advice, and Vonnegut being very generous with his time and helpful. And now Walter has half a dozen novels and is a full-on writer. Not just because of that, nice. but it helped. So that's just a cool thing. Jealous. Yeah. And as far as other updates, I think that completes our episode for Fates Worse Than Death. Woo! -hoo. And our next episode will be about the novel Time Quake, written Woo -hoo. in 1997. The last Kurt Vonnegut novel. We have a couple other episodes from there. Yes. It's not over yet. But uh, the last novel. Yeah. It's crazy. And it also, and that, there's a big gap because Hocus Pocus was in 90, Fate's Worse Than Death 91, and then he tried to write Time Quake a, t a couple different ways, and then over those years finally put it together into a novel where he's also writing the novel in the novel. Yeah, I it's love Time Quake. It's a great one. Yeah. So join us for that. That's up next. And after that, we'll have Bagambo Snuffbox if you want to jump even further into the future. But I don't know. This has been a very fun uh, look at a pretty okay set of essays. I do know that it's been a very fun look at an okay set of essays, Alex. <laughs> and if this isn't nice. What is? That we could have gotten in unison. Come uh, on. Yeah, we really could have. You didn't yep. even try to get no, that in unison. It. I lost it. <laughs> I have five unisons a day. That was all the five. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>